Hey, how's it going, universe? Welcome to another episode of Zoobox Goes to the Movies. This week, we're going to be looking at two movies. And to help me, uh, Jeremy of Jeremoby fame. Find his uh, at Jeremoby on Twitter. Jeremoby is his YouTube channel. How's it going, Jeremy? It's going pretty well, Sean. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to, to not be infected with any sort of rage today. Well, so, you took, uh, I took my Valium just before I came on because I am. Okay. I am definitely infected with rage on a constant basis, and I have to medicate myself with Valium <laughs> to stay straight, you know, to stay just normal, to stay neutral. You know? Yeah, this, this one-hour or two-hour conversation is going to be your solace for the, for the night. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so, obviously, if you don't know the reference, we are talking about uh, 28 Days Later. In the blink of an eye. They're infected. The virus struck. Eat the blood. Keep away from it. There's something in the blood. The devastation spread, and the world he knew was gone. No! 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 He thinks he's alone, but he's not. They wake up today in hospital. Fight! Days later, Rated R starts Friday only in theaters. And 28 weeks later, I think we'll probably end up talking more about 28 days later. Um, but we're going to be talking about both of them kind of probably intermittently. And uh, this film came out in 2002. It's directed by Danny Boyle. This was his fifth film. It's written by Alex Garland, which is, uh, if you, people don't know, big sci-fi writer nowadays. Uh, he directed Annihilation a couple years ago. He had a fantastic series, actually. It was one of my favorite things of the past couple of years, a TV show on Hulu called Devs. I work all day and get half drunk at night. Waking at four to soundless dark, I stare. Till then I see what's always really there. Unresting death. I don't know if you've seen that. It's really, it's excellent. If it's you like, like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you like Alex Garland and you like the kind of material, the kind of topics he explores, it's well worth your time. Um, yeah, and this was their second time working together. They had worked together on a movie called The Beach, which Alex Garland adapted from his own novel. Uh, and, that's where, and they had a working relationship for a couple of years, I think, because they did The Beach, they did 28 Days Later, and then they did Sunshine a few years after this, I believe. Uh, the film stars... Killian Murphy, Naomi Harris, Christopher Eccleston, uh, Brendan Gleeson, Stuart McCory, Megan Burns, and others. The logline plot synopsis on old IMDb here is, four weeks after a mysterious and curable virus spreads throughout the UK, a handful of survivors try to find sanctuary. So yes, now we're off to the races. So this was a viewer request. It was requested by, uh, I think, Maverick, who's watched us for a couple years. He's from the UK, so he probably wants to hear what a couple Yanks think. <laughs> of uh, <laughs> of this kind of a very well, I do think it's like generally a universally kind of understandable thing. It does feel very specific to the UK. It feels very like British centric. Yeah. Um. You know, just because of the landscape, the places they go, the kinds of cars they drive. I don't know stuff like that. Sure. But um. Anyways, so, geez, how old were you when this came out? You must have been like what, like ten. This was 2002, right? So yeah. I would have been, uh, yeah, like se uh, seven or eight. Yeah, around that. Yeah. <laughs> I was in. I think I was uh, in a sophomore or maybe going to junior year of call or of a uh, high school, mm -hmm. and um, I saw it opening weekend. I saw it with everybody, big crowds and stuff like that. Did you see this when it came out, Jeremy? Oh, uh, unfortunately, my uh, I. We were we were religious at the time, so no, I did not see this one in theaters as a as a young lad. <laughs> oh, okay. So were you guys religious? I mean, not to pry too much, but were you guys religious in the sense that you just like didn't watch like genre movies and stuff like that? Your parents? Well, I mean, you were eight years old, so it's yeah. not like it would be. Yeah, come on, Jeremy. Let's watch Twenty Eight Days Later. But well, it's it's, it's funny. I I tell people this like I uh, uh, so I was I grew up Mormon actually. Um, oh, okay. Uh, but uh. My parents were actually pretty liberal about what I could watch generally. I mean, they let once I was like about ten, like they were okay with a lot of R-rated stuff. So yeah, it, at that point, it didn't yeah. really matter. I, um, but uh, twenty days later, like this, I have an interesting like uh, memory of when my dad bought this at an old like 
CD shop. Uh, it would have been back in like 20, 2010, 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he, he was just like eyeing it and like looking over and reading like the pamphlet and whatnot. I go up to him and I was like, well, what's that movie about? He says, oh, it's about a bunch of angry people in London. I'm like, okay, can I go watch it with you? He's like, yeah. And uh, we, we, we popped it in the, the DVD player that, later that night. And it was just a, it, I didn't know what to expect going in when I just looked at the cover because it really does hide so much of what to expect. The DVD case, I don't know what the Blu-ray looks like, but... Um, Actually, it looks exactly the same, Jeremy. <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it reinvigorated, like, a love for zombie films. Um, so. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, like, you know, because, so, okay, so you came to it, you end up watching it when you're a teenager. I saw it back yeah. when I was, you, I, I was probably around the same age just back in 2002 when I watched it. And I was already kind of a genre fan. Like, probably not as deep as I became in later years. I would say 28 Days Later is definitely something that probably got me into zombie stuff because it was there was a resurgence. There was a brief resurgence. There was, like, a five-year period where they were just making zombie movies. That's when, you know, Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead remake comes out. 28 Days Later comes out. Romero comes back and does Land of the Dead and then Diary of the Dead and Survival of the Dead. We don't need to talk about this. Um... <laughs> But so there was just like, in, you could go to the movie theater and see zombie movies again for the first time in what felt like probably 15 years. And um, yeah, and it really was, it was, I mean, and I was also a young kid. I, I you know, had aspirations to be a filmmaker. Uh, hearing that Danny Boyle made it, shot it all in mini DV, that yeah. was also yep. a fad at the time. Um, and that's always, you know, Danny Boyle, if you go through his filmography, he's always doing interesting stuff with tech, with uh, camera tech and doing things. I mean, you know, he comes back to the prosumer stuff when he does 127 hours like a decade after this. Um, and so I was just kind of interested on that aspect. And when, when I went to go see it, you know, you find like such a impactful, visceral experience and uh, definitely like formed, I think, a lot of my taste and what I expected out of zombie movies for a while. So it was probably like, you know, watching some of the older stuff is probably led me to unfairly judge a lot of movies. Because my expectations were kind of set by 28 Days Later of like what I thought is like a serious, hardcore zombie movie should be, you know. Sure. And um, but what were like so? What was your kind of experience? So you were like, like around like 16 or so. You ended up watching for the first time. Were you already into zombie flicks and stuff like that, or no? Yeah, I mean, I, I I've always had like a love for horror. When I was by the time I was like about seven or eight years old, I just. When I, I saw, like, uh, posters for, you know, Friday the 13th mm-hmm. and things like that, I'm like, oh, man, this is, like, some other territory that, like, I'm supposed to or I'm not allowed to touch or go near. And I just, when I when I could, like, sneak it, sneak watch it on cable, like, when my parents were oh, sick yeah. or whatever, I would just, for a while, like, I felt like such a re- rebellious, like, little kid. And then when I turned 10 and I watched the thing with my family, it's like, oh, I don't yeah. be rebellious anymore. <laughs> yeah, it um, was, I had a very similar experience. I was very, like, traditional Catholic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually a uh, frequent guest on goes to the movies dan prophet he was actually his family was mormon so okay nice All right. yeah uh but we, in regards to 28 days later um yeah i mean by that point by the time i'd seen it i'd seen like the classic zombie stuff uh yeah night of the living day or even like going farther back i'd seen like bella lugosi's white zombie yeah um, it was just on tv and I'm like oh this is mm-hmm. interesting it's the guy that plays dracula <laughs> yeah exactly uh, yeah uh but this it's it's ironic that this like respond to that, that that resurgence of that subgenre because ironically they're not even zombies in the no. movie and that's what that's what that was my big takeaway like oh you can make a a virus themed film without it having to be people coming back from the dead you know it, you can make it something that's just more impactful and, and rageful and having you know these creatures that aren't like walking and 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 yeah exactly around are, are sprinting at you and are going to tear you apart well it's interesting because the what they use as a as a jumping off point for like the zombie virus whatever or the rage virus is ebola we evaluated overall trends in deaths due to infectious diseases looked at in this way infectious diseases haven't gone away they have increased as a cause of death in recent years after decades of decline the threat to us at the moment from infectious diseases is probably as big as it's ever been and getting worse. The threat of infection to human mortality on a worldwide scale is still very great. 
we have to anticipate that there will be a major pandemic. At some stage, there will be many deaths associated with that. I remember actually when I was at secondary school and my, my teacher was saying that, you know, we shouldn't worry about global warming or any of these things. She said you should worry about viruses and that, for some reason, has always stayed with me. There's something very interesting happened while we were filming. There were two German scientists who um, created a totally synthetic um, polio virus, but they got all the material off the web. That is the new fear, isn't it? You know, even in weapons of mass destruction, what everybody's really worried about is the anthrax, smallpox, those kind of things. Infectious diseases are indeed the new paranoia that's striking Western society. It is this fear of invisible threats to you, you know, just something there in the air waiting to strike. If you forget about a disease and consider it beaten, then um, the organism will take the opportunities which you increasingly offer it. That's what they use. Okay. That's what they that's what they model it after and how that affects human beings and how it's it's uh, uh, transferred between people and stuff like that is through blood. And so that that's what they use as a jumping off point. Because I think at the time, like in the early 2000s, uh, you know, because this was filmed right before 9-11 happened. And I know post 9-11 there was like anthrax scares and stuff like that. But there was a sense of kind of communicable diseases. That was something that was kind of going on in the world. You had like mad cow disease around this time. Um, bird flu, avian flu was around around this time as well. So it was kind of in the air. Like the interest was there in the public. They were kind of primed for something like this, which made it coming back to it now <laughs> after the past couple yeah. of years we've had. You're like, oh, wow, this is like not that crazy. Because I remember back when I was a kid, I was like 28 days. I'm like, everything fell apart in 28 days. Like, there's nothing left in 28 days. And now, after the past couple of years, I was like, oh, there'll probably be nothing left in about yeah. two days. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, it'll just fix itself in 28 weeks. Uh, okay, how, what's the numbering here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. I wish... Oh, my God. Well, we'll get into that later. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so coming back to it, it felt very prescient. Like, in a way that it really hadn't ever hit me before uh, because we kind of lived through not obviously this but we've lived through the idea of of viruses and being afraid of people and social contagion that was another thing Alex Garland was very interested in was like the social contagion aspect of it and just about kind of um, uh, the increasing casual aggressiveness of Western culture that's the way he looked at it it was like you know the violence in media and stuff like that and even in the beginning of the movie that's kind of what they, they start framing it with that, right? Because you see all this what looks like post-apocalyptic footage of riots and violence and all the stuff that's happening around the world only to reveal that that's just stuff that's on the news. Like yeah. it, in, in before this virus gets out and they're, they're, making, they're making chimps watch it. Yeah. Monkeys watch it uh, while they're trying to develop this, this uh, Ebola-like virus. Doing gain of function research, I guess. You yeah. Call it. <laughs> and it pisses off PETA. <laughs> yeah, and it pisses off the PETA, the PETA guys. And they always come and they fuck it up. Yeah. They're busting in there. Uh, it's actually reminded me of a. It's a really dumb, dumb thing to remind me of. But uh, have you ever seen Jane Silent Bob Strike Back? <clears throat> I am the master of the clit. Remember this fucking face. Wherever you see clit, you'll see this fucking face. I make that shit work. No one rules a clit like me. Not this little fuck. None of you little fucks out there. I am the clit commander. It's been so many years, but yeah. Oh, good good for you, by the way. Um, but yeah, yeah, they go and they, they break into a facility and break out all the animals. Oh, it's, kinda, it's like if it yeah. went wrong, this is what would happen. Um, yeah. And it's actually a really great introductory scene. And that's one of the things I actually really like about 28 Days Later is the structure of it and how well... It kind of uh, introduces you to the world, what is happening, and all of the rules. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, with the first 20 minutes, it's all world building. It's all there to set up the rules. And then the movie kind of plays out in a way that it both can adhere to them and then subvert them when things go wrong. And you have characters kind of having to, like, deal with the fact that, oh, they're we kind of know this and we know we shouldn't do this, but we have to do it because of the circumstances we're in. And it kind of builds a natural tension and drama that I think a yeah. lot of horror movies don't do. And it's something, actually, that the sequel, 28 weeks later, in my opinion, completely fucking fails at. Oh, it but. completely screws it up. It does a full-on, just like, 
cliched 180. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. Like, I was like, uh, the first act of, not to skip too far ahead, but tw- the yeah. first act of 28 Weeks Later is excellent. And it sets up yeah. a very interesting movie that never happens. Yeah. But, but uh, we'll get there. Um, so, yeah. So, I don't know. Do you have any, like, what, like the, so let's just talk about the first act. Like, the yeah, first act sure. of, up to them basically meeting uh, Frank. So what did you think about you know the characters setting up the world like how they they divvy that stuff out like what were your impressions of it? Well, yeah, I mean like I guess starting from even just like once it cuts to Jim and and this was like the first big shock and not that I hadn't seen at a young age maybe <laughs> just one a film but it's like oh not shit that I yeah. had never seen a male penis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to talk about it so awkwardly now. <laughs> Uh, no, but it, like as you know, you, when you see that like as one of your first big wide shots, you're just like, whoa, that threw yeah. me off, off course. But you know, I I I was not familiar with Killy Murphy. This was probably the first film I'd seen him in before. Yeah, I think and, it was most people's first film. I think he had done like two bit parts before this. Yeah, and that might have been a Danny Boyle decision to mostly have a cast of unknowns to kind it of was. keep more yeah grounded. Yeah, um, I like it when directors do that too, um, and. You know, the, I, I would say you know, the, the big thing that people remember, I think, from 20 Days Later is just the barren wasteland of London, just the empty streets mm-hmm. uh, that you see the tumbleweeds and just the all the rolling plastic and things left over and just not a sound, not a car. I mean, cars honk. They can still work. But, um, you know, it, it, there's just it's there's nobody, you know, that he can tell. And he's constantly yelling out, hello, hello. Hello. A common greeting shared amongst every culture, amongst every part of the world. You know, you expect a response, and no, he doesn't get it right away. Um, I think all of that, I think, is the one of the perfect setups. You know, it's really it big. is because it's immediate. You immediately understand the stakes, even yeah. without before you're told like what's going on. Yeah, I mean, we got that. I think the opening scene with the uh, with the chimps is great. I think it's a great opening scene. Yep. Um, then you have like the panic doctor who basically exposition dumps, but does it in a way that doesn't feel like it's expedition exposition yeah, yeah. jumping because he's trying to appeal to their rational selves. Like you can't do this; they're they're contagious. The chimps are infected. They're they're highly contagious. They've been given an inhibitor. Infected with what? In order to cure, you must first understand. Infected with the... what? Rage. What the fuck is talking about? Time for this shit. Get the cages open. No, no, no. Listen, you sick bastard. We're going and we're taking your torture victims with us. We're going to get you out of here. Listen, the animals are contagious. The infection is in their blood and saliva. One bite. Stop. Stop. You have no idea. <laughs> um. Yeah, but it's so great. Yeah, you immediately understand what's going on. It's actually, I think. Robert Kurtzman, the guy who did the The Walking Dead, I think he completely lifted this from Twenty Eight Days Later. Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've ever read the comic books. I used to, I read them like years ago until bit. I found out that they were never going to stop. Then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Um, but and I think even the TV show basically has the same, very similar opening, like similar thing that happens to the lead character, because uh, it is. It's such a great way. It's a, it's a shortcut. Yeah. You get to be like mise en scene. You just throw your main character into something that's already happening, yeah. And uh, and then you get to explore that reality through his eyes, right? And and so it makes it okay that people are explaining things because he's the audience avatar. And, um, and it it addresses too, like this is just a small tidbit, but like he was in a coma, so obviously he would be very hungry and thirsty. Immediately, just chugs Pepsi or yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. starts collecting whatever he can when he sees like what has the world come to? What have I missed? Well, it's a great scene. Actually, the scene when he he stumbles into the church, yeah. like it's a great scene. It's a great little moment, like great little freaky, terrifying moment. Hello. Hello. 
Hello? Butter. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done that. Yeah. I was uh, just like, holy shit. <laughs> like, you yeah. go in there, you think people are just in there sleeping or whatever. And, uh, yeah. And it's a lot of crazy stuff. And Danny Boyle did a lot of homework about kind of, um, like, fallen states, third world stuff, a lot of, like, or uh, past pandemic, like, a lot of photography and stuff. Because there's a lot of shots and a lot of references to the, that kind of stuff throughout history that people might have been subconsciously familiar with maybe not consciously know that they like under like seen that image before yeah but like you kind of subconsciously remember it just probably from being in school or whatever and it's it's incredibly effective it is yeah i thought it it really was i i didn't know how much it indirectly like influenced my early home movies and home videos because i was shooting on high eight and mini dv longer than some of my peers where i didn't make the conversion to uh hd until gosh i want I won't say not till like twenty, yeah, till like twenty ten or so. Yeah, I was I was just filming on those old school tapes, and uh, I realized, you know, oh, and ever I think back to twenty eight days later, I was doing Dutch angles, kind of like what I was seeing in the film, or uh, kind of still stick to that grainy look. I, I wasn't lighting things very well at the, at a young age, but I was still trying to like remember just like just framing yeah. devices with those cameras. Yeah, it was, exactly. it was inspiring. I don't know. No, totally. And that was one of the the draws of the movie itself for me. I mean, I was I would watch anything that I saw somebody said that was shot with a prosumer camera cuz I was like, okay, I can get a prosumer camera. I have a mini DV like camcorder. I have a high 8 Sony camcorder. Like I could I think I could do this, right? Yeah. Like, uh, obviously not. You know, obviously they're they're working with a little bit. They always say that it's like, oh, we shot this on an iPhone. You find out they use like a sixty thousand dollar lens. Yeah. Like, you're like, okay, guys, thank you. <laughs> but like, that, um, that's a big Soderbergh thing. Uh, he he oh, seems yes. to just like jump into his iPhone on random movies. <laughs> what is it? I think he did Unsane. That was all shot on an iPhone. Yeah. And um, oh, what was something? There was another movie that was. Oh, Tangerine. Did you ever see Tangerine? Uh, Tangerine was good, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Sean Baker. Actually, he's 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 a great director actually. But uh yeah, that and uh Florida Project, I don't think he used I think he used regular cameras for the Florida yeah. Project, but um but the looks are great. He captured a really great look. Um but Yeah, yeah. So I was I was just like you just super like interested in it just for that. How did you feel about it coming back to it though? Like watching Did you watch it on I assume you watch it streaming, right? Uh, I still have the 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 DVD, that same oh, DVD. So you, did you watch the DVD? Yeah, because it comes with uh, the commentary track as well, yep. and then the two alternate endings as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was gonna ask because I watched the Blu-ray, and I know yeah. that it's on HBO Max right now, so I just didn't know if you'd watch it there. Um, and it looks awful uh, <laughs> on a 65-inch TV on okay. high def. It looks fucking terrible. Yeah. And and I was just like, ah, oh, you know. I don't know. Like this was a cool experiment at the time, and yeah. I don't know. But then I watched Twenty Eight Weeks Later, and that was not done in that. That was done kind of like a normal movie. Sure. And I was like, well, that movie looks like shit too. So I don't know. <laughs> but there was just something like it's like I intellectually I understand what why he did it, and he did it to like have the the feeling of a home movie. That's like part yeah. of why they did that. Actually, I watched the movie, just for a little side tangent. I watched the movie that used. Uh, prosumer cameras really effectively and I think for the same reason that Danny Boyle did. I watched that movie Open Water. Daniel, where's the boat? That's a good question. As we are stuck in the middle of the ocean. Oh, God. Oh. It's okay. It's okay. This can't be happening. 
That yep, shark yep. movie open water. I, I saw you watch that, and I I want to revisit that one again too because I remember it also had that same home movie quality to it. And and it because it's not like a found footage movie. It's not. It's like a regular narrative, but the actual the texture of the home movie, especially for that one, actually really works and yep. really brings yep. you into the feeling of it. Probably actually more successfully than Twenty Eight Days Later does because Twenty Eight Days Later is still very cinematic. It's just using. That can't that you know using mini DV mm -hmm. uh, rather than um, rather than regular cameras, but they're kind of still doing the same things with it like that you would do like what you would th trying to achieve the same kind of shots and stuff that you would with a regular film camera. Uh, whereas something like open water is very like floaty and kind of all over the place, kind of it's never like annoying, but like it does give you that sense. It feels like oh somebody's just filming them. And then it actually works in its favor in that case. Uh, this one, I, I just, I was a little bit distracted at times, especially in the darker scenes. Like it, it actually really, yeah. really kind of made it hard to see. But you know, that's also it's kind of part of the texture of the movie. So I don't, I don't hold it against it in any sure. major way. But it's just something I kind of noticed. I just wondered how you felt about it. But if you watch the old DVD, I guess you know. Well, yeah, I was gonna uh, add to that. You know, I, I can't imagine how ugly it must look in some scenes just in 1080p kind of quality I, I, I couldn't watch it like that if i could um yeah i watched it on dvd because it was at the time formatted for that type of disc yes and, and vhs too while it was still around but um uh yeah and i think that lent to i i personally like the aesthetic enough just because it's so relatable i mm -hmm. think that's kind of also yeah what as we were saying what danny boy was kind of going for um and it's just it's got such a unlike you know unlike 35 millimeter or maybe even maybe more extreme like 16 millimeter film which has also got this earthiness to it um yeah i don't know what it is about digital video but it has this specific type of grain that's just so uh specific it, it's specific and and, yeah. and and feels like you're you're more immersed in there like i don't know it just well, it's also like, you know, because so many people, and one of the great effects of it, and it, obviously for people like ourselves that were, were young kids, we were filming stuff, we're very familiar with what it looked like, so it felt like even more relatable. But most people, right, they're watching home movies. Mm -hmm. So they're watching, you know, their bar family barbecues and vacations and stuff like that on that same kind of stock. So it immediately kind of... It's almost like breaks the fourth wall and like really invites you in and makes it just feel more real yeah like, and i assume that's what they were going for i would assume you know it, it is also very limiting because you find out on set uh you know a lot of the actors were very new to working around that kind of format as well they sometimes didn't know when they were blocking their scenes if they were in a wide and how much exposure they were getting because you know when you're working with digital vid, you're only so limited you don't get to really play around with lenses as much and no. depending on the camera but it, you don't yeah you don't get a whole lot <laughs> i'm sure they had some sort of rigs and stuff for some sure. of that stuff i'm sure they did because i mean there's even crane shots and shit in this but yeah yeah um but although i've seen i've seen like documentaries of people that shot films on mini dv that just like bought a crane for the day yeah, and yeah. then somebody like sitting on the boom on the chair with their little <laughs> fucking Sony yeah. handy cam on the top, like zooming in. I don't know. There's um, a there's a funny um uh, twenty minute uh, making of documentary that kind of goes with this the this film, and I forgot that there was like a period. I don't know why this was the aesthetic choice, but you know when there's sit down interviews with cast and crew members. For whatever reason, they decided to just kind of cut and shake the camera around a little bit, just to kind of get like filming their hands yeah. or something. He's like, "You're not even focusing." Cinema verite, <laughs> dude. I, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember. Yeah, it was everything was like uh, extreme, right? Yeah, like, everything yeah. was just like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna have our little EPK behind the scenes thing." Yeah. Like Matt would be like the movie. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> audacious, <laughs> radical. Yeah. Still. Yeah. No, I know. I know. I noticed that too because I watched the uh, the special features this morning actually, uh, for twenty eight days later, and it was and it's funny because it's such a dated like making of. Yeah. You know, it's got like the British television woman like narrating it and stuff. Twenty eight days later is a terrifying new thriller from Danny Boyle. The man who brought us train spotting. It was I don't know, it was funny. You yeah. just don't because they don't make stuff like that anymore. They don't. No. Even when you go buy movies like boutique label stuff, they just like dump a bunch of raw interviews as special features. It's been very disappointing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, because it's all going to YouTube now with like Vanity Fair and all these other entertainment channels and such. And it's just like, I don't want to look at these actors like reading tweets. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> I'm so hyped right now. Everything has changed. Have y'all ever seen Tron? The end of the Tron where everything light up? This is all in caps, by the way. This is very important to know. You know, I, I, who is, what? Really? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. Every once in a while, though, I'll get sucked into a hole where I'm like, why am I watching, like, actors interviewing actors for five hours? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, before I know it, it's like three in the morning. I'm like, holy shit. Like, I did not need to know what Jonah Hill thought about this. I just didn't. Yeah. And here I am. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, like, for all that kind of stuff, it definitely feels like of its time. Very much. It very much puts it in a time and a place. Um more so than I mean, I guess you know all movies have like a certain they bring a certain sense of the history of when it was made with it, you know, style choices, trends, et cetera. But this one even more so because of the mini DV. Like it really, to me, it really reminds me of being a teenager, and yeah. and uh, really puts me in that kind of headspace in terms of of uh, just the verisimilitude of of the of the way the stock looks. Um, and I thought like overall, it's pretty effective. It is. It, mm-hmm. it was a little distracting, though. Watching it in HD, I don't really recommend. I don't think you should watch Twenty Eight Days Later <laughs> in HD on a big screen TV. Like I don't. I, I'm such a purist too with something like The Evil Dead. Like I love that on VHS. It's hard for me to watch it in any other more polished. Really? Like, it just yeah. It's like it just has that kind of quality to it that I don't want to. I just don't want to see it cleaned up. <laughs> see, I've had I've watched like I've like Evil the Evil Dead series is like one of my all time favorites. I've bought it on every single format that's come out. I used to have the VHSs and I had the DVDs and I had the Blu-rays. And now I have the 4Ks. Um, you know, surprisingly enough though. Dude, the Evil Dead 2 4K is a pretty awesome 4K. Okay. I mean, Surprisingly I, I, enough, because they didn't clean it up. Like, mm-hmm. it's not cleaned up in the sense of, like, there's no grain or anything like that. No, it looks it looks, it looks, looks like exactly like you think it would. Or yeah. it should look, actually. They, like, maintain the integrity of it somehow. I don't know. It was cool. I was pleasantly surprised by it, because I ended up just buying it because I'm a... I had to. I felt like I had. It's like my catcher in the rye. You know, I got to buy it. Yeah. So I don't. So I don't do anything stupid. <laughs> but I, um, I had a similar reaction. Sorry, I got a bug on my screen. Uh, um, I had a similar reaction to uh, Night of the Living Dead when the Criterion released. Yeah. That because the quality of it actually looks like it was shot not too long ago. If you really. Yeah. No, it looks look great. It. The yeah, texture that, is amazing. Yeah. No, it is. It is. Well, I mean, they. You know, shooting on film. That's why, like, when I buy 4Ks, I don't really care about new movies. I like old, buying old movies. Like, anything from, like, the f- 1945 to, like, uh, to, like, 1990. Yeah. Usually, like, you'll get, like, a really great transfer, especially, you know, people at home. Warner Brothers does actually really great work uh, with their transfers. Uh, their 4Ks, Warner Brothers generally tend to be really, really, really good. Um. But anyway, that's a little little movie collecting tangent for you there. Yeah, we, we got it all. Ourselves. We got it all. <laughs> got to throw it in there. Um. So and then after that, so you know, we go through that where they you kind of meet the characters. You meet Selena, and you meet I think the guy's name is Mark. Yeah. Um. And then they go back to Killian Murphy's family, so like parents' house, and you kind of and then you also get more world building there because you see like the devastation that it's that's actually happened and the the lengths people would go. You find out Killian's parent or uh, Killian Murphy's parents. Jim's parents, rather, uh, committed suicide.
Uh, laying in bed together. It's like, you know, it really kind of, I, I guess, it's a way to drive home like this personal drama, but also kind of tell you how people felt in the world, you know? And reinforce almost like, you know, Selena's kind of paradigm where she's like really cold and put off. Because that's another thing. It's like the 28 days thing. Did you ever feel like, like I said kind of at the top, like, do you did you ever feel like, like it was that's not long enough time for this to be believable i mean if you were to ask me like that question like pre 2020 i mean i'd have to i, I don't know it pro probably not you know i'd say like it would probably take a little bit longer um but yeah but after the past couple of years you see people just yeah immediately go crazy yeah 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 and it's like it, it's almost kind of daunting how much to the movie indirectly kind of predicted, even the making of kind of talked about this too a little bit, but just where we were going to be headed. <laughs> well, because it's interesting because like, you know, this communicable disease thing has been a thing since the 90s. And it's every once in a while, like I talked about early on in the podcast, like it'll come back in the news, it'll be come back in the zeitgeist. Like we had an Ebola scare in 2010, I think. Yeah. Um, and even the people that were, like, running the CDC and stuff at the time, uh, they did, like, a post-mortem on it, like, in 2014 or 2015. And they're like, oh, yeah, if that was if that was actually bad, we would have been fucked. We would have really fucked it up. Yeah. That's what they were saying. They were saying, like, oh, no, if that was really, like, a bad disease, like, that could have spread and killed people, we would have fucked it up mm -hmm. based on, like, what happened. Um, so, yeah, it is. It's, it's very pressy. It's, like, eerie. A yeah. Bit. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little yeah. eerie. <laughs> but yeah, go, going to that scene though again, where they they revisit Jim's home, um, it's so sentimental and and quiet, and uh, not a lot of words are spoken, which I kind of also like. There's no big exposition exposition jump uh, dro drops on the whole situation. Like you yeah. find out in like loose terms, like oh, he was a paper boy. He had a simple job. You know, he was still close with his family, and now he kind of lost that that. I guess that surrogate father and mother figure, and uh, he, over the course of the movie, kind of finds those figures, sort of, um, until he kind of takes advantage of his own situation and, and learns to. Uh, well, I, I might be jumping ahead, but well, no, it's because it's like you know they set up very early the the like with with Selena basically, right? That yeah. she is not a community person. She's yeah. given up on the idea of collective effort and and the community coming together and looking out for one another. She does, she's all for herself because. Uh, I guess it's not in the movie, but they talk about it, I think, in the audio commentary where uh, Danny Boyle and the actress who played Selena came up with her backstory that she had to basically kill her whole family. Um, and that's why she is the way she is. Uh, but that's like kind of their... They have like a parallel journey, like Jim and Selena, which is he's kind of... he's He wants that, like, you know, because he, he was... That's how his life was, right? Like, he, yeah. he is a family-orientated person. He is... Uh, a guy that thinks you should do the right thing, you should help somebody, even if it means you could die in the process of doing it. Make like, a sacrifice. What is, yeah. what is the point of surviving? What is the point of just surviving? You know, if you lose your humanity in the process, kind of. And that's you know, Selena's journey is to she comes around to that, like kind of appreciating the 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 benefit of the group and a group dynamic. Yeah. Um, even when it's challenged by Christopher Eccleston by Doctor Who and. And the fucking the rowdy rape boys. Um, yeah. I was gonna say, it, it felt, you know, you have to show both extremes when you when you have those like parallel journeys yeah. as well to show the yeah the, the benefits and also yeah the the dark side of the it. The darker side of it, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and then that's kind of one of the first like big, not well, not a big set piece, but it's the one of the first like uh, big violent moments in the movie is when you know Jim's neighbors come over. <laughs> Ah, <sighs> this 
<sighs> and uh, <laughs> and Selena kills them all, which was like uh, for me. I I made a note uh, of it actually. Like when I was watching it, I was like, oh, like you know, because it's communicated or not communicated, but it's transferable through blood. And Selena's just fucking hacking at people with a with a machete, and there's blood everywhere. <laughs> there's blood getting everywhere. This girl's going a wild abandon. Yeah. And I was just like, I was like, oh, that's not too smart. And then on the in the audio commentary, Danny Boyle. I don't know if he's just like rationalizing it or if he's just kind of like he's just like he was like oh yeah because she her character she just didn't care anymore and uh, she's just crazy. It was funny. Uh, did you listen to the audio commentary? Have you ever listened to it? Yeah, yeah. So that uh, last time I watched it, I listened to it with the okay. audio commentary, and I was hoping, yeah, they would explain how they don't. Either, yeah, the, uh, yeah. It's like I was like uh, so I just have to suspend my disbelief enough. You know, you know, I was I was so shocked. That is a very dry commentary. And surprisingly it was, yeah. so. You're like, and they don't really explain anything, and they basically tell you all of the mistakes they feel like they made in the movie, <laughs> and like how they were like, yeah, we set up all these rules, and we kind of just like didn't do anything with them, but it kind of yeah. works. Because <laughs> when yeah. I first watched it, I was like, oh, this is great. Like, they set up all the rules, because this is, I have a complaint with horror movies a lot, is that you never understand the rules, so you never know, like, when you should or shouldn't feel tense or a pull towards something like because if there's no rules established that can either be broken or be met then what the fuck am i watching you gotta I, this is a problem a lot a lot of times with like boogeyman type movies with sure. like uh things like you know, like the the equivalent of something like freddy krueger it's like imagine if you watched nightmare on elm street and you didn't know like what the rules for freddy krueger were you wouldn't have a movie yeah like they did that there was a uh a lot of people didn't like it, and I didn't like it either. The Bye Bye Man. Did you ever hear of that? Bye Bye Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is a movie that never explains the rules of the Bye Bye Man, and then just and just continues on. And the Bye Bye Man can just do whatever the fuck he needs to in the situation. And there's no there's no rules for them to fight against. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, I, but but this movie does a good job of establishing those things, and then only yeah. to listen to the commentary to hear them say like, well, well you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> A, a bunch of things there. First off, I have like a specific memory from the Bye Bye Man. It's like one of the worst edited shots I've ever seen where the girl is running to the train track or whatever and the train's about to hit her or the Bye Bye Man's about to make the train hit her or whatever. Yeah. And she's running, like she knows she's going to the train track and then she turns around and the shot shows her looking the other way and then the next shot shows her like gives her like a, a face of surprise like she wasn't expecting to be on the train track and then she gets hit. It's like... It was like four different directors were directing four different shots. They were yes. even like on that whole movie is that whole movie is you know maybe someday Jeremy it'd be fun that would be a fun one to do okay. just because how fucking dumb it is and like how frustrating it is to watch. Yeah, uh, I watched that movie. I put it on one night. I think I got it at one of those like discount store like big lots for like two dollars. I was like fuck it, yeah. I'll buy it two bucks. Sure, sure. sure. I was I was just hoping to have some fun like watch yeah. a dumb fun movie and I was just like mad at it. Yeah, but uh, but, yeah, but yeah, uh, to 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 go back to um, Alex Garland and Danny Boyle, like these are guys I figured like had a really strong bond and really worked and gelled together pretty creatively. And it seems like yeah, the the commentary track is like they were sitting there and being held at gunpoint to not really <laughs> espouse their their opinions of the movie and just yeah, as you say, just talk about a lot Which, of mistakes. Yeah. I wonder if that's like a choice on their part, you know, because some directors they just don't want to get into it. They just like no, like I made the movie. You yeah. feel however you want to feel about it. Like, I don't care. Um, but I don't think that was the case there. It's like almost at some point they were trying to, like, figure out what they had made in some respects. Sure, sure. Um, you know, because I'm, you know, they probably recorded that commentary right after they made the movie. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming they, when they were putting the, the special features and stuff together, a lot of times they'll record the commentaries before the movies even come out. Yeah, uh, it's funny because you sometimes you'll watch like a uh, watch an audio. I can't remember the movie, but it was a movie that ended up being a giant bomb. And the guy even says in the commentary, he's like, oh, opening weekends in like two weeks. I got my finger. I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> and no, it didn't happen. Of course not. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and I think uh, I think that also like, you know, I think Alex Garland's a good writer as well in the sense that he he writes characters that you you don't have to spend a lot of time with them for them to feel like at least tangible. Like they feel real. They sure. don't feel like very stock. 
Um, I think, you know, obviously there's a little bit of archetype filling with these characters, obviously, because it's a genre movie, and I think they, they do kind of fall into genre conventions for characters. Um, sometimes they subvert those, sometimes they don't. But um, they're all very relatable, like, and especially like when you get to the scene with uh, Brendan Gleeson as Frank... Frank, anyway. Jim. Selena. Selena, good to meet you. This is my daughter, Hannah. Come on, sweetheart, say hello. Come on. So, this is great. It's just great. Of course, for celebration, I'd say. Why don't you all sit down? And, uh, Hannah, what have we got, what have we got to offer? We've got Mum's creme de menthe. Great. Uh, creme de menthe. Aye. Look, sit, please. Get comfortable. Where are the bloody glasses? Middle cupboard. Ah, the good ones. It's a celebration. Top cupboard. The taxi yeah. driver, everybody's favorite dad. Um, I love that character. Oh yeah, I love that character. It's like, one of my favorite roles of his, actually. To be honest. Yeah, and Brendan Gleeson, and and he has a fucking murderer's row of great roles in his career. Yeah, he's like one of those guys that, like, I don't know if it's like a, a lot of Americans, like in the U.S., they just don't like really acknowledge him very often. But he's a he's a fantastic actor. Yeah, he's yeah. good in everything he's he's in. He's good in everything, no matter what kind of movie, comedies, drama, whatever. He's he's fantastic. He was even in a, a Smurfs movie, and I think, I, I don't know if he was, I, I'm sure he had a fun time in that too. When I read the script, I really liked the character, and I actually, I liked the script itself, I kind of felt, um, I just, I just, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a really interesting, you know, it does explore some little interesting aspects of things, and then uh, I watched the original movie, obviously, and the, the whole technical thing was pretty impressive, so, yeah, I, I, I have to be honest, it was initially the character rather than anything else that drew me to it. Hey, everybody's got to pay the bills, man. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but he's such a great character, and it's such a great... Uh, it changes the tone of the movie. That's another thing I really liked about the movie, is that it's able to... It's constantly, like, bring it, ratcheting the tension up, ratcheting the tension up, and then giving you that time to breathe, and giving you, like, a little bit of perspective on, like, what happened, and the characters kind of sit there and sit with it for a little while. And then you bring in... You introduce, like... Frank into the mix and his daughter Hannah and they're like very likable they're like very yeah. normal people and you like being around them and you root for them um, and it's kind of a great reprieve because for this middle of the movie like because they kind of go on like this little journey they go on yep. this little like car trip the road trip together and uh, it's actually I was I was taken aback by how like heartwarming and fun it was I was like oh man I could watch this for like ever I could watch this for an another hour just them dicking around, like, looking for gas and food and stuff. Well, and th that speaks to, like, the, the underlying theming in the movie, which I was kind of surprised in rewatching. It's, like, it's shockingly hopeful mm -hmm. 20 days later. It, even, like, it, it shows those scenes of darkness and, and just brutality, but it's the whole time it's, like, these people slowly grow to, to learn, like, well, maybe there's a chance out there that more people will reach some sort of civilization again that will yeah. return to restore peace and harmony, as cheesy as it sounds, but yeah. Yeah, because they're kind of, they're, they are symbolically, that's what they like represent in yeah. the movie, is that, oh, you can keep going. You can yeah. survive, and you can't, and you won't lose yourself to do it. Like, yeah. Selena is on the precipice of losing her humanity. Now, you can make the argument that the soldiers, when they get to the soldiers, Christopher Eccleston and whatnot, like, they have kind of lost the plot, except for the one guy. Except for yeah. that one dude, <laughs> uh, but they, but they have kind of given up their humanity. They're just they've just decided decided to just go full primal, full yeah. primacy, and then only go after like these kind of base notions of like human need. They want mm -hmm. food. They want sex. They want to shoot guns. I yeah, guess. I don't know. Just consume, 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 and yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. And, and well, and. Uh, I'd say one of the one of the great other scenes in this too is that that whole supermarket sequence where they're just kind of, you know, it, it felt I don't know if it was if any of it was improvised at all, but it felt like 
Brennan Gleeson gave it his own little touch oh, he's points so great. too. I love when he yeah. finds the 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 like the whiskey or whatever. Oh, the that chat that I have with the scotch. Yeah, right? yeah, he's like talking about it. Yeah, because it's probably something he couldn't afford yeah. like in his regular life. There are you know? five of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, single malt, sixteen year old, tart, full flavor, warmer, not aggressive, <laughs> peaty aftertaste. Takes out the fire, but leaves in the warmth. Actually, one of the one of the things I really loved is the introduction to uh, Frank and Hannah is when they f- first get in there and they want to like be normal, so they want to offer them like uh, a drink and uh, and then I noticed there was one thing I noticed in the movie that I never really picked up on before, but it kind of just was a clues into like who Hannah and Frank are is that they still have their goldfish alive and they've left yeah. them just enough water to live in, even mm-hmm. though they need water. Right, like so, yeah. they are like very humane people. They like mm-hmm. are very caring, innately good human beings. Yeah, and that's like a clue into that, right? Without having to tell me that. Yeah. So it was cool because, like, you know, there was a thing like I never ever I don't think at any time I've ever watched this, or even when I saw it the first time, did I ever think that they were tricking them? You know what I mean? Like some, you know, a lot of times you watch like zombie movies or. The Walking Dead or whatever, and you would meet somebody like that, but they'd be like cannibals or something, you know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but not. But they. I kind of like the straightforwardness of this, like that. It was just like, no, they're just good people, and they're just fucking stuck in their apartment. Yeah, and it, yeah, and ironically, it kind of forms a little bit of a family unit too, just by surprise. And maybe there could have been a little bit more time devoted to Selena, kind of warming up to them a lot more, because it, it is kind of rushed how it just. She's it just kind of happens, yeah. It just happens. Yeah. And I, you could say, like, maybe that's just uh, Danny Boyle trying to speak. Because he, he does this in a lot of his films. He injects kind of, like, uh, a sort of, like, realness and a humor to uh, just humanity in general. Mm-hmm. Like, he likes just uh, dynamics to just be very, very human. Well, and, maybe, I, and maybe that sometimes happens, you know, like, it just happens, you know. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I think that's, you know, one of his strengths as a filmmaker, because, you know, Danny Boyle is pretty eclectic in terms of, like, the types of, the or the types of stories he wants to tell. Yeah. And he's always changing things, always monkeying around with different kinds of tech and stuff for filming and stuff, but he always brings, like, this really, like, uh, an energy to it. And a lot of the times that, and that is very recognizably Danny Boyle. Like, that's what, like, I think the mark of, like, a Danny Boyle movie is that sense of, like, pep. There's a pep to it. And, um, but he also, even though he oftentimes deals with a lot of very dark subject matter in his movies, going all the way back to Shallow Grave, his first movie, and then Train Spotting, yep. uh, you know, about junkies and shit like that, he he is smart enough to give it a light touch sometimes. Yeah. It just it makes it inviting. Like he understands, like yeah, you have to like these people. Mm-hmm. Like you can't. You know, you know what I mean. Like the, you, you can't just rely on the context of the situation for us to feel something for them. You know, like he makes you like them, and I think, mm-hmm. uh, it, like his just his style of of working in terms of of just kind of weaving that kind of stuff and and really understanding the the need for peaks and valleys in a movie like Twenty Eight Days Later. Sure. Um, I think it really shines through a lot, and it it, it does a it does a lot because it's a very simple movie. It's very straightforward. Yeah. It's not complex at all. It's uh, <laughs> well, honestly I, coming back to it. I was like, "Wow, it is this is very simple." Like I didn't. I for, for some reason I just in my mind's eye I was like, "Oh, there's something more. It's got there's some some more complexity to it, but not really." I mean, well, yeah, because when I was before like getting into this, I was thinking like, "Well, maybe the movie could have benefited from being even longer or even done as a miniseries." But now that you kind of bring up the simplicity of it, like I think I just kind of like it. For the length that it is, just because yeah. it's not really telling anything, it's telling some deep things, but nothing that's like, yeah, like two and a half hours worth of of your time, you know. Well, I would say this: I would this would be a criticism. I would, either it be like a four hour miniseries, or yeah. they sh- they could have cut fifteen minutes out of this movie. You know what okay. I was really surprised by? Uh, I what? forgot I forgot how quickly they got to the 
the army guys, the military yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, that I remember. It's an that. hour into the movie. It's halfway into the movie. I was like, oh wow, I thought that was like the last twenty minutes, but no, yeah. it's like the last second half of the film. Yeah, because I consider that the whole third act. It's, so it was just such a short, like yeah, yeah, the, the second, yeah, yeah. The first two acts are like thirty minutes each, and then the third act is like an hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was really surprised. I was like, oh wow. And honestly, and I think some of that stuff, if there, if I do have a criticism of the movie, it's that it's very heavy-handed. Yeah. Once they get into the military guys, they like really kind of beat you over the head with it. Uh, you know from immediately that something bad is going to happen. I don't think there's any illusion. Yeah. That uh, that these guys are like have their best interests in mind or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, and it's 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 such a. Um... Yeah, and, and and in the context of the film, it's such a dark turn for for a while as Jim was seeing Frank as like, again, like a surrogate father almost in a way. And uh, I would say, actually, that might be my favorite moment just because it's so it's so fr- frequent and quick, but it's like so heartfelt. Is the, the second he gets infected. Which oh is, my God, dude. There's not a whole I, lot of time to process all that information, you know, and, and I, the movie knows that. I, I was watching it this morning. Uh, and my wife was getting ready for work. And I had like a little tear in my eye. And she was yeah. like, what are you doing? I was like, shut <laughs> up. Leave me alone. <laughs> Let me have I, this. I really did. And I, because they, they, they set Frank up to be such a, like a beautifully kind of genteel, but like strong presence. Like yeah. even when Jim's like having a nightmare, he's there to like pat him. He's just like, hey, you're fine. Don't worry he, about it. He's not even in a panic when they have to repair the car in the cave is, or the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is another great sequence in the movie. Um, yeah. I really like that. And I really actually like the uh, the idea that the rats also are trying to get the fuck out of there. Jesus Christ! Oh, no! Fucking rats! Get off! Infected. Yeah, that was a nice well, little touch. Every time any movie ever shows just a huge army of uh, rats going the other way, along, like I'm always in my head, like follow the rats. In fact, <laughs> sprint past the rats. They know where they're going. You should do the same mm-hmm. every time. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it's yeah, it was a nice little touch. Even the rats were like, yeah, I'm out of here. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, but that scene with Frank and like. It's the one time in the movie where he like shows he's frustrated, he's angry, he's basically telling this bird to go fuck itself. Yeah, <laughs> he's telling this crow to fuck off, and the, and he just happens to get a, a a little bit of blood in his eye. Oh my god, it's so awful. All he can say to his daughter is like, "I love you," and then at that point she tries to come over, and he has to start yelling at her to go away, and then he turns. Like it's yeah, it is heartbreaking. Yeah, I'm fine, sweetheart. Sorry I lost my temper. Hannah, I love you very much. What? Keep away from me. Stay where you are. Dad? Keep away from me! Dad? Keep away from me! Keep away from me! Keep away! Keep away! Keep away! What's wrong? Dad! Oh. Jim! Jim is infected! No! No! Jim! No! Jim, kill it! It's it's so intense. <laughs> Especially like, you know, and I know I go on and on about this kind of stuff uh, in movies and stuff, but like having like a kid and when I see stuff like that, it's just like sure. really guts me, like really guts me. Yeah. Really have become like a huge softy when it comes to stuff like that nowadays. But um, yeah, because I could feel that. I could feel that deep in my bones. I was like, oh my God. But yeah, it's so, and it's such a great moment. It's such, it's a great movie moment and it really kind of just, it, it, it's because it, it's like it puts a period on that part of the movie and then we know we're into like kind of a different phase because the movie tonally shifts pretty heavily in that yeah. i think in the third act yeah uh it becomes it becomes almost like a weird like uh what do you call them uh trying to blank here 
Like a like a genre or a... like a, yeah, you know what? You're next. Like a home invasion. Film. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes almost feels like almost like a home invasion movie, uh, or like a reverse home invasion movie, I guess, to a certain extent, where they're they're locked in. You see all this stuff. They're setting up like mines, and then you yeah. see the walls, and you see the barbed wire, and you think like, oh, that's to keep you safe, but it's also to keep you in. Yeah, you know? with a slight revenge angle by the the, the last cl- the big climax, the climactic. Fight battle sequence. <laughs> yes, which yeah. it does, it, and this is when it does like, uh, which in modern times this is cliche, which is like, oh, we are the Walking Dead. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know. you know, where's Killian Murphy? Like, oh, like he's 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 got the rage too, and he's yeah, not right. even he doesn't even have the disease. Mm-hmm. Um, like men, we drive each other to violence. People drive each other to, to madness like this. It's, I, I, it's inescapable. <laughs> Yeah, I I just want to end like uh, every movie I make now with just the most vague message, like oh, I wonder who the real cannibals are. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it has just, nothing to do with the context of the movie. You no, know, it's not really about where we ended up. It's about the friends we ate along the way. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um yeah. No. But like. Um. Yeah. So it kind of shifts its tone a little bit, and it's definitely like you know I feel like it's it, that is my like I think that section is very heavy handed. I like Christopher Eccleston, who's like the main guy. He's the leader of the group. I did like him. I think he, he is properly menacing. Um, but almost like a little bit too much. Like there's no... I never... Like there's no question that that's going to end badly. Yeah. Like from the moment they meet that guy. You're like, oh, that guy's up to no good. <laughs> like immediately. There's, you know what I mean? Like it would have been cool if there was like a an ambiguity to it, at least, especially if you're going to spend an hour there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, and also, he kind of just, in many ways, gives his cards away so quick to Jim that, you know, and, and is so quick to offer him an ultimatum and not really think, well, you know, we're, what we're doing right now is kind of horrible and Jim could easily just be crazy and kill us all right now if he wanted to. And it's just like, he, you think he'd be more methodical. Yeah. Eight days ago, I found Jones with his gun in his mouth. He said he was going to kill himself because there was no future. What could I say to him? We fight off the infected or we wait until they starve to death and then what? What do nine men do except wait to die themselves? I moved us from the blockade. I set the radio broadcasting and I promised them women. Because women mean a future. Well, the, that's the thing I don't under like. What is the point of like ingratiating themselves to Jim? Like, why bother with like the dinner yeah. and all that all stuff? The like, yeah. why not just shoot him <laughs> and take like that's what you were gonna do anyways. Yeah. Like, what as we as as is revealed when they march the sergeant and Jim off into the woods to execute them, there's a pile of bodies. Other people have showed up there. All dudes. Yeah. <laughs> a bunch of dudes shows up, and they're like, we're not interested in dudes. Yeah. Um, which I thought was very, very homophobic and not cool. But Yeah, they didn't have one gay soldier on the team. I know, not the, one gay guy? <laughs> Maybe he's the one that could turn into a zombie. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> At least uh, you, the, the zombies get their, their, their final laugh, though, so it's, uh, I guess it, it equals, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, and it's, this is like, it's kind of a, it's a mild criticism. It doesn't, like, bother me in the sense, like, oh, I, I can't enjoy the movie because of it. It's just, like, it's so subtle, and it does such a great job being kind of nuanced and uh, really threading, th- threading that needle, like, just, just right. And yeah. I think that is where it hits a little bit of a misstep, probably up until like the last 20 minutes of the movie, which is kind of Jim breaking back in and trying to save sure. the girls, which I think is a super effective like home invasion movie kind of moment. Yeah. Um, and I did like, you know, even though we were kind of joking about it, like, oh, Jim's got the rage too. Like, it it, it does, I wish it was more ambiguous. That is actually yeah. something I wish. If we didn't was, know, yeah, yeah. If we didn't know whether or not he was infected. Because they did this thing, and I think it's it's either in the commentary or something I read, where that they would use do like the slow motion on the DV camera, and they would do that to create like this weird staccato effect. Yeah. Uh, when the zom- whenever they would shoot the rage mon- the rage zombies, and then they did that 
whenever they showed Jim in the final sequence. The problem with that is, like, they didn't ever imply that Jim might be infected. They never did that. So yeah, if they had, yeah. if they had done, if there had been a moment where, like, the last time we saw Jim, he was being chased by a by a rage monster, a rage zombie. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, just to sure, get that sure. ambiguity there. You know, yeah. just so so when Selena is gonna fucking cave him in with a machete, like maybe with, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. Then it's a big surprise. Just like it is for her, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, treat it like a reveal rather than the kind of, uh, I guess, like almost like a pseudo tragic moment that she would have killed killed Jim even though he wasn't a raged zombie. Yeah, I, I was gonna bring up. There's a couple of really interesting moments like within that that climactic scene where uh, I like the bit where uh, the, the the one infected guy um, is looking at himself in the mirror. And it's taking a pausing point and just thinking, wait, what's going on here? Because here's the other thing that they do briefly bring up in the commentary track is that, yeah, they're they're grunting and shouting and and full of rage, but they're also like espousing little words and like, like the, again, this is what separates them so much from zombies is that they still kind of have a mind, a functioning mind. It's just they're too angry that they can't think about anything else other than kill who's not what I look like or. Or how well, I yeah that was if there is one thing that I was never really understood is like how it works in the sense of like how they identify who they should attack should they just be always just ripping each other apart like all you the time think so yeah, right and I, yeah and I wonder if it's just like some more like psychic psychological thing that that, well, it, I that mean, it never explained yeah you know Garland is pretty upfront about the the fact that like he's cribbing from a lot of zombie movies of the past. I mean, they basically, if you looked at the things that are in 28 Days Later, it's like a truncated version of like Romero's original trilogy. Yeah. It's got a little part of each of those movies in it, even ending with military guys and then finding out that the rage zombies actually talk a little bit. Yeah. You know, because that's how Day of the Dead, you find out like, oh, they're not so stupid. And then yeah. Romero took, kept going with that idea in Land of the Dead to, I guess, I mean, I haven't seen Land of the Dead in a long time, but... Which, uh... Oh. Uh, Bubba from Day of the Dead, big shout out, one of the best zombies ever, ever on screen. Decay with threatening mobility. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. Um, yeah, so like it, it's interesting because it's it, it, it like if you were a genre savvy, if you're familiar with those movies, uh, it probably like actually helps a lot when you watch something like 28 Days Later, just almost like, because there's tons of references to all of the other zombie movies that have been made, but they're not overt. They're just not subtle. It's really more like subtextual stuff and also just like little details. Like like you said, like the, the rage zombies kind of murmuring stuff, which they kind of try to do a little something with in 28 I, Weeks Later. Yeah. I mean, it, it's weird though, because I didn't really pick up on that until the commentary track like said that was what was going on. I mean, I caught like gibberish but never like full-on sentences or words if yeah. they were saying anything like that to that extent um, well yeah that's the thing because it's like you know it's about this thing that makes you uncontrollably angry and full of rage to the point you just want to tear people apart <laughs> but like I, I suppose like you could you could imagine that like well it doesn't mean you can't like speak or communicate totally yeah, like that is something about the movie that's like a little nebulous. Like, how does this actually? What do you mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. why, are they, why aren't they all just killing each other all the time? Like, why? What they would? That's what they would do, right? Yeah. How are they? Why are they discerning? You know, why are they discerning zombies? But minor complaint, I suppose. Uh, but I was gonna say the other the other thing that like was a big standout. It was pretty hilarious, and this kind of speaks to 
uh, Boyle's skills for injecting humor in, in just the right places was uh, Hannah being on Valium during the whole thing, too, and just kind yes. of having this calm demeanor. In fact, which, scaring the, the military guys into thinking that they were all going to die, which they do, but... Yeah. Those pills. I think they're having an effect. I can feel them. And... I don't feel sleepy. But... They've been a long time. What are you going to do if they don't come back? Would you be the officer if Henry is dead? Is that the way it works? Shut up! I don't think they are coming back. I think they've been killed. So, so shut up! Hannah. They're dead. And you're going to be next. Well, it, which comes from a very dark place. Exactly. Actually. Yeah. Hannah being on Valium comes from yes, yeah. Maybe the darkest thing moment in the movie is when she gives this little girl Valium because she's going to get raped. Yeah. Again, the stem is hugely dark, and then they yeah. find a way to just kind of ease out of that. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's what he's good at. I think like yeah. Danny Boyle, because then it doesn't feel incongruent. Like yeah. you're not ever pulled out. Like, oh, what? What? Like, we almost got raped and now we're being silly? Like, it never feels like that. He's able to maintain, like, a tone. Yeah. Um, which is his skill as a director. That's credit to him as a director, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, they had all the, uh, you know, the end of the movie. It's basically implied they got saved. There is some sort of hope. But there was a bunch of alternate endings. Because, like, you know, you had said that um, just a few minutes ago that the movie is surprisingly hopeful, right? Yeah. I mean, the original, the the alternate endings are all downers. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Except for one of them. Well, one of them, which obviously, because they basically went in and reshoots and put Killian Murphy in the end scene, because there's a version of that where he's not there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also there's a version where the movie just ends when he dies at the hospital and the girls mm -hmm. are leaving. And yeah. then there's the radically different ending, which they never shot, but they did in storyboards. And then... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you watch that? It was cool. Uh, it, it was interesting. It was more like goofy sci-fi kind of almost like zombie movie stuff where they go back to the lab where the monkeys escape from and there's a doctor in there. And Jim stands with Hannah outside the safe room. Selena stands a few feet behind. I've got someone I want you to meet, James. This is Hannah. She's 14. And her dad is infected. We've got him tied up. Jim breaks off. If you know of a way to cure him, it would be good if you'd just tell us. Silence. Then the man appears at the viewing window. There's a catch. They wait silently. The infection's in the blood. So change the blood, full body transfusion. And there's no infection. Change the blood. Someone has to give it, Jim. That's the catch. A pint, two pints, three pints, it's no good. It needs to be every drop. They re and it reveals that, like, oh, you have to do a complete blood transfusion. And uh, Jim yeah. ends up being the one to... And then they, well, they capture Brendan Gleeson's character, Frank. They knock him out or whatever, and they bring him to the lab, and they do a blood transfusion, and Jim dies, but Frank gets to live. <laughs> but I don't know for some reason like Danny Boyle he was talking about it on the thing and he's just like he's like I don't know it just seemed like too too stupid <laughs> and that was the problem right there with this ending we'd established that one drop in the eye will infect someone then how the flying fuck are we going to sell the idea that this blood transfusion idea is going to work what you what do you do clean out every capillary and vein with bleach before making the transfusion <laughs> yes <laughs> we just couldn't like, I don't know, how, how would that work? How would that work? But. When I was watching that alternate uh, version, I, it was reminding me of, like, a lot of the ideas they were probably exploring with the Will Smith I Am Legend remake a little bit. Like, they were like, we can take this in so many different directions, and it's like, it just got more and more absurd. And that's a movie I think is okay, but, like... Yeah, it's okay, but it's it's very, like, Hollywood, very, like, CGI. It's uh, What's that guy's name, that director? He ended up doing a bunch of a couple of the Hunger Games movies, and then he also directed. Yeah, 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 he directed a uh, Constantine, yeah, yeah. the the Keanu Reeves movie back in the day. Can't remember his name. 
but I don't know. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a like, okay, it's okay. It's a movie that you could watch on like a lazy Saturday and fall asleep and yeah. wake up at you know. It's it's a it's a basic. I would even argue kind of a hollow look at just a last man on earth scenario and. Yeah, yeah well, I actually when that came out, I was I'm actually I was actually a fan of the book, mm-hmm. uh, Richard Matheson's short story, and I had read Great like book. somebody had done like a comic book version of it that I had. And then I read, uh, I read like there was like three different screenplays because Ridley Scott was going to do it at one point with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which I was like, God damn, that would have been awesome. Yeah, <laughs> like late '90s Arnold with uh, Ridley Scott directing it. I was like, Oh, that would be fucking killer. And that script is much more of like an action movie, mm-hmm. but it was better than the one. That, <laughs> it was better than the one that uh, ended up being made. At least, yeah. like the script was better. Uh, and at least, and it also, he at least says, "I am legend" in the fucking the one that was never made. He never, they don't like the the title "I am legend" is like this idea that like you are the last man on earth. You're actually the bad guy. You're the boogeyman. Of. Yeah, you're yeah. the boogeyman now because you're yeah. the only one that's not a vampire. Like, yeah. <laughs> and they don't do that. In the fuck, it's so frustrating. They don't even touch on it. It's it's annoying. But but you even bring up like. I love going down just all the rabbit holes or watching documentaries it was about the, the movies that could have been like Tim Burton's Superman or, or Yodorowsky's Dune. Like these yeah. could have been outstanding. Well, I don't know. I'm not going to go that far and say they could have been outstanding, but they could have been interesting. interesting. They're, yeah. interesting. they're, they're, they're really interesting. They're interesting ideas for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like when I watch uh, Yodorowsky's Dune, that documentary, I'm like, well, that sounds really awesome. I don't know if we were going to be able to pull that off, but it sounds cool. Yeah. Like I didn't read Dune, but I have a friend who said it was fantastic. You sold me at the pitch meeting. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I would have bought the pitch for yeah. sure, and then, and then I would have been the studio executive to get fired for buying the pitch when it bombed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah. So I, I, you know, it was it was, inter- it was funny. Like back when this came out, twenty eight days later, they re released it in theaters later that summer with the alternate endings. You could go watch oh. the movie with the alternate ending, um, and you didn't know which one you were going to get. So depending on when you went, and I ended up going to see it again, and uh, had a very like awkward date with a <laughs> the girl that I liked, and she liked me, and like didn't know how to communicate that to to each other, and uh, yeah, so I had a very awkward date. But I got to see Twenty Eight Days Later again. So okay, you got something out of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a shout out to Tess if you're out there. Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, the ending though. What do you make of like the? This, the technical switch to 35 millimeter because they they dropped the digital video at that point and I didn't notice that until I last rewatched it. I was like, oh crap! They just it's almost like it kind of bleeds into like the hopeful aspect a little bit. Like we're kind of progressing into a, a cleaner quality. I yeah, guess. I guess kind of right. Like yeah, it's not so dystopian. It's yeah. Not so like it doesn't have that grainy digital home movie feel. It feels more like a movie. Like almost almost like more like dreamlike. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't think is the intention, but... The, I'd say the scariest part is the dream that Jim has with all the uh, sheep, I, I guess. Or was it sheep? Or, I can't remember. When, the, he wakes, when he wakes up in the ruins? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Oh, when he thinks he's all alone? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be fucking terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, that, I, was, I, was, I mean, I was... Yeah, I was thinking about that sequence just like in terms of just how... Uh, that might have been like the most hopeless. It, it probably felt in that moment, I think. Um, and then, yeah, like the ending is like the opposite kind of effect. Oh, you know, actually, speaking of that, that, that actually that dream and that sequence. Before I forget, sure, I because I, I made a note of it. Um, that's reminded me very much of that's a very Alex Garland touch to have them sleep in the yeah. ruins uh, while nature is taken back over. Because that's kind of a theme in a lot of Alex Garland stuff. Is that like. Yeah, we might die, and the world is just gonna keep going. Yeah, it is. Com- nature is completely indifferent to what you want to create, mm-hmm. uh, and I thought that was like a nice little interesting, very Alex Garland touch, because that's pretty much that is seems like his almost singular obsession mm-hmm. is like man versus nature, and nature always wins. Like you yes, just cannot beat it. Yeah. Um, uh, what do you make of Alex Garland's other work, especially the ones that he's written and directed uh, lately? So what did he? He's he's he wrote, wrote and directed Ex Machina and Annihilation, right? That's yeah. it. And then he did Devs. And the sh- and Devs, yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually I th- love uh, Ex Machina. Uh, bringing that one up. Um, yeah, I, I like it. 
No, no, I'm sorry. Go for oh, it. Oh yeah, I was gonna say there's like a little bit of man versus nature in there, but it's also technology and and yeah and and yeah AI and. <laughs> Which is also, yeah, but I think it's almost like because that's an extension of man's like endeavors mm -hmm. um, and like our 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 constant search to control the nature of reality and um, existence. We want to be gods. Like, we want to yeah. be gods. And that's what like AI is. It's, it's a way for us to live forever, basically. So, sure. you know, that's kind of an extension of that. And, and even in, but even in Ex Machina, like the nature stuff is very prevalent. Like if you look at like where that, uh, where Isaac, Oscar Isaac and Donald Gleason, who's Brendan Gleason's son. Yeah, I'm about to bring that up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who like you know where they're where he's working on his AI stuff. Like he's out in this beautiful like mountain and there's nature everywhere and running water and because he wants to feel like he's part of it. Like part of he is part of the natural progress, the natural process. Of existence, like that's the way he kind of looks at himself, and that's part of his hubris. Sure. Um, and then annihilation is very much like uh, an alien, a sentient alien being comes down that we don't really quite understand, and starts fucking with our genetic code to basically fold us back into nature. Yeah. I, which I think is actually, uh, I really like annihilation. Actually, actually, I think I have the poster somewhere. Oh, nice. Uh, I I need to go back and give it a third rewatch re because um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have such like a mixed opinion on Annihilation because I think a lot of there's a lot of effective scenes in it that really mm -hmm. like stick to memory and really, really have stuck with me for a while. Um, but then there's just I don't know. It, it falls into a lot of just like cliched trappings that a lot of writers fall into that you would see with later sci-fi horror-esque films of its elf. Oh, I think it's definitely pulling from a lot of stuff. He, I yeah, think Alex sure. Garland does that a lot, actually. I think yeah, even, that's him, yeah. Even Ex Machina is not, like, that original. It's really not. It's just, it's elegantly done. Elegantly yeah. executed, for sure. sure. Um, and it's really the execution that makes it different. I understand where you're coming from with Annihilation, because I, when I first saw it, the first time I saw it, I didn't like. I never really bounced off of it, but I definitely was a little colder on it. Uh, but I also read the book, and mm. I knew a lot about the movie before it came out, and I think that really informed my viewing of it because uh, I listened to Alex Garland kind of talk about what his intentions were and where he was pulling from to make the movie. Like, there's a lot. Tarkovsky's like Stalker is a big touchstone for that movie. Um, also, he he had a really fascinating way of writing the script where. He read the book once in a night and then wrote the script in a week. What I thought was, I can't see a straight beat-by-beat -beat adaptation, but the effect of reading the book had a very powerful effect on me. So what I'm going to do is in a way adapt my subjective experience of reading the book. I guess if it was a certain kind of thriller, you could do an obje objective uh, adaptation where everyone would agree yes that's what happened at this moment and that's what i felt at this moment but i think this adaption of annihilation is much more uh, personal or subjective than that which maybe makes maybe is why it's it seems a little maybe underdeveloped i guess in a way but he said he's like i don't want to do a direct adaptation and he got in, in touch with the author and was like i'm not going to directly adapt it i want to like kind of work in the tradition of the book and I want to do it like off of my memory basically of what I feel like happened in the story. What I re remember the story being like the dreams that the story made me have. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I can understand that one not working though for you I, or for, for anybody really. I, I, I get sure. when people push back against that one. Like I get it. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and like you kind of described it, it does have such a lucid dreamy sort of feel to it, which I, I really did kind of appreciate. And um, and and the sound design, I think, was one of the biggest takeaways from that movie too. I just I was hearing like, you know, it, it's uh, I know the, the the Christopher Nolan like droning sound in trailers is like a big the uh, Zimmer the, the Hans Zimmer yeah, Bom. but this but but this movie kind of like played with it a little bit more and and amplified it to sounds I'd never really heard before. I was I I commended that fully. And do you also remember that the movie had a lot of Netflix trouble 
like upon release too. Yeah, like, I saw I saw it in theaters, but like sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I saw it in theaters as well, but uh, I guess they had like no faith in the movie, so yeah. overseas in Europe they put it on Netflix. Like all like two weeks after it premiered, so those torrents were up. But I yeah. did. I went to see it in the theater, and yeah. then I torrented it. <laughs> Um, as we do yeah yeah i did i went to see it in the theater though because i like you know i like yeah. alex garland so it's like and i sure. appreciate that there's somebody working on original properties in genre that's not like uh trying to be uh, that's not part of a franchise it's not part of something i am familiar with i like people that are just out there doing original work even if it is mildly derivative i do think uh i think if you like Alex Garland, you you will like Devs, but it is the most Alex Garland ass thing he's ever made. Like that is okay. very it's like no compromise. It is Alex Garland full tilt Alex Garland. Okay. <laughs> so if you get a sense of that, I think it's probably the best thing he's done uh, as like a writer director myself. Okay. I thought it was the most effective thing. And then I would probably do Ex Machina and then Annihilation at the end. Um but like I you know I would go back to Annihilation, though. Maybe, like, maybe not to say that just because you're you're a film fan and stuff like that, like, go listen to some interviews with Alex Garland and hear what he had to say, like, about sure. the creation of Annihilation. And I think it actually informs the viewing and it makes it more of an interesting movie. Not to say that, like, you should have to do that kind of heavy lifting to go watch a movie. Mm -hmm. But, um... But even even just... Even isolated in a vacuum, the last 20 minutes of Annihilation, I think, is amazing. I think it's awesome. Uh... Yeah, the, that's, that's she, great. Yeah. yeah, when she meets the alien face to face. it's kind of got like a slasher movie kind of structure and it's a little bit like the thing almost you know when you got this group of like people i don't know you, you, you uh yeah i mean i've, I've found that I, i'll end up being more surprised and ended up liking a movie i never thought i would have liked beforehand just by yeah again listening to interviews or just hearing about the making of uh, a good channel I follow, uh, Good Bad Flicks. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with I know it. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I had my opinion changed on several movies just because. Like, was it um, what's the movie called? Uh, uh, Nothing but trouble mm -hmm. uh, with Dan Aykroyd. Hey, hey, ho, ha, ho! <laughs> hula, hula, hula! The bula, bula, bula! Look who's got the front seats of the Mexican hat dance now! Just like a bunch of spiders in a birthday cake. That yes. he like just hearing like the hell that went into making that movie, like almost made me kind of like it a lot more than I initially did when I first yeah. I was like, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> and now I think it's like it's fun and actually very hilarious in, in many ways. Well, well, exactly. Well, I mean, I think it's just like you know sometimes I I always give a movie like more than one shot, yeah. especially like if I bounce off a movie really hard the first time I watch it, I will definitely watch it again because sure, uh, just to see, just to see, just to see. But like, yeah, like it's very easy to have like your like a piece, given a piece of information, or somebody shows you just an angle that you've never really thought of when you watch it, and it changes the whole experience, and it's 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 awesome. Mm -hmm. And luckily, there's people out there doing good work like that. You know, for all the shit people talk about YouTube and stuff, there is especially uh, for film analysis. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah, a lot of yeah. a lot of very talented people out there. You know, absolutely. Yeah, just avoid the uh, the. The, the screen junkies types and then the ones oh, that are like oh this is the kill count or whatever <laughs> yes the screen junkies cinema sins i've never understood that like yeah. people liking that it's like the nitpickers paradise yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's just awful so yeah so there's a lot of garbage but you you go find yourself a hot twenty five thousand sub film analysis channel it's probably pretty solid <laughs> who, who were you um spotlighting or retweeting recently the this guy uh he was like one of the like 
earlier like YouTube critics who so butthurt over people liking Marvel and and, and oh uh, Christian Harloff yeah yeah I remember yeah, no, him he, in his heyday yeah. he he was butthurt because people would make fun of him like so Red Letter Media yeah they, they, just, the, nerd they did the, the nerd crew which was basically making fun of Collider the point is that every single person in this room behind that camera leave each other the fuck alone when yeah, they want to have opportunity and opinions on what they want to think you, you yeah. can think whatever the fuck you want to think fuck leave yeah. people alone and it is, it is not it is not fucking wrong to be passionate about Star Wars it's not fucking wrong to be passionate about any movie that you like going to comic cons going to celebration and you think it is and you think oh well, well you're too well to be doing it. fuck you fuck you in the face because you should be able to do whatever the fuck you want and be passionate about it fuck you for making fun of people for being passionate about their shit go suck in a fucking toad fart <laughs> and that's what it was and that's christian harloff was part of that and then he got and then there was a clip of him lose like having a meltdown because he wasn't invited to star wars galaxies and he's like can i do a show on here and we do so much for them and i didn't even get a fucking invitation Okay, let's see what's going on on the internet today. They see Collider, yes. and they go, oh, it's everything. Correct. So everything that, you know... That, they already that, invited Collider. Well, they think every, yeah. Right. They think everything that Christina and, and Haley will, will see is that they will, that they will now go on Jedi Council and do it, and that's not how it works. Part of doing your job and is talk about it. You yeah, could just I, ask I'm them to. be stubborn and say, I don't want to. Okay. Um, I, and I You're don't. going to, though. What's that? You're going to. I don't want to. Uh, no, because it's our coverage. Uh, Haley's got a lot of really good interviews with Imagineers. Uh, that so first of, all, first of all, I don't want you to do that on the air. You can call me after. So, you know what? so then someone else hosts the show today. Someone else hosts the show today. You get, you know it's the second time you've done this. The first time you've done this, you burst in the door. You, you, you started the show by saying you're not going to talk about it on Jedi Council, which and I, is your show, okay. but you're not the producer of it. And I am actually. I am actually. I, 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 yes, I am. I'm actually. That was the deal I made with Fernandez. I'm also actually, uh, no, just the same way you didn't know. The same way you didn't. The same way you didn't know that I was the fucking head of development at one point, a head of content. Where you're like, oh, I think you're just head of development. I walk in to Fernandez. I can clear it up. Content and development. To which now is not the case. You are, and I get it. But I, first of all, if you want to do this on the air, we do it on the air. But I am not, but I am absolutely not talking about it today. You can have Rope host it. How about that? I mean, if you don't want to host the show, because, I don't want to. Oh, I'm so sorry you didn't get to go last You're night. You're welcome. See, you can, if you want to do this, again, we can do it all the only because you, you have the same thing. And what people also don't realize no, with you, no, you, you, you act, you act hot-headed, you act <laughs> hot-headed all the time. You don't want to cover yellow people, content. but you want to do it now, we can do it now. You don't want to cover Collider's content is what you're just saying on, on Collider Live. <laughs> that's glorious. That's that's glorious. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> like very entitled, but yeah, that side of the like film criticism, it's not real film criticism. It's not. It's just like you know, but, you know, we all watch it, though. We all know what that shit is. Yeah, we're, we're aware. It's just, it's just very, very sad. Like John Campia? <laughs> yes. You gotta watch John Campia to see, like, a, like a serious film opinion? No. <laughs> They're good every once in a while, like, because they'll have, like, scoops. Like, they, they will get the news. Mm -hmm. So for that kind of, like, tabloid news stuff, like, every once in a while, I'll go, like, watch a video. But most of the time, no. I don't have time for that shit. Yeah. Um, well, well, and it's um, kind of taking this back to 20 Days Later for a sec. Um, lately, I don't know, in the last few years, like this movie in particular, 20 Days Later, it seems to have a weird... Its reputation has kind of evolved a little bit where it's it's seen as either, in a lot of film circles, kind of overrated or just not... It's kind of devalued in a way that's not considered great or innovative anymore and people just kind of look to other things. And it, it, Denny Boyle himself... I've always kind of admired him as a director, but he's kind of seen as this kind of middle to bottom tier sort of just yeah. director that like has no style or, or vision or, or voice. And I'm like, I there's something there. I've always thought there always was, but I don't well, know. I, Maybe I'm I, on a weird end of it. I think it's because like his, his eclectic, like we had said earlier, he has like such an eclectic filmography when it comes to like the types of stories he tells. It makes it feel like he doesn't have an identity. He feels like a tourist. 
Yeah. I think for a lot of things. So if you go watch, like, go watch, like, uh, what is it called? Uh, Slumdog Millionaire, which I think he won the Academy Award for, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I um, think so. I think, I don't know, if he didn't win Best Director, I think he won Best Picture. And um, it's weird. It's a weird movie to go back to. Like, it was very much in the zeitgeist. Like, that's why it was, it was popular for... You understand why it was popular in, like, the general public, because it, it feels like a very touristy type movie that's very superficial, doesn't really understand Indian culture, doesn't really have much in, interest in trying to. It's almost, like, too light in certain respects. So I think sometimes, like, he, he can fall victim to that. But, I, like, I, I think the reason why people have, like, have a backlash to 28 Days Later uh, is because it was oversaturated when, for years. Yeah after it came out like you came to it late but when i was like a kid dude i have seen this movie probably like 40 times in my life like everybody always wanted to watch 28 days later it was everywhere it was everywhere for a couple years um and then 28 weeks later came out and completely killed that (laughs) that momentum uh but but because it kind of revitalized the genre it was it was a movie that did a zombie movie differently you know um, I, but I think, I think the way that they, I think the mini DV thing probably ends up probably going to hurt it in the long term in terms of popularity. Although I don't know. I just don't hear people talk about it anymore. It's almost like, feels like it's completely like forgotten. Well, even in like pandemic craziness, the last 16 months or whatever, it's like, it wasn't like the first go-to film. They all wanted to watch, uh, Soderbergh's, um, Contagion. Contagion. And then like yeah. that's. That movie really like lost its flair pretty quickly. I mean, last year. <laughs> yeah, I actually, when I watched a bunch of those, I watched Contagion. I watched the Outbreak with Dustin Outbreak. Hoffman. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, where he's in a fucking helicopter, like going to find this Reese's monkey. Like, yeah. Um, it's got yeah, the but weirdest what, cover, by the way. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, the floating heads, dude. Floating heads in the monkey. <laughs> I, you know, my dad took me to see that in the movie theater. Um, nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I guess it's just, it's yeah. You would think it would have come up, right? Like that would have been in the rotation for people. And I did not see really. I don't think I saw anybody talking about it. Yeah, which is weird. That is weird. That's yeah. a weird thing. Well, before we we jump to uh, it's it's. Uh, lesser uh of quality sequel we didn't even talk about the music and the score oh the score is uh yes yeah, very John Murphy's, uh, I, I i was like i gotta tell you right now um uh, uh what's it called uh in the house heart what's the heart what's the sound called the heartbeat uh the the famous theme that everybody knows twenty yeah, days later for the one that every like movie trailer and shit <laughs> used for a hot ten years. I can't tell you like how many times like in my early high school days of high school cross country I was running to that shit like all the time cuz I had a different sort of response and energy you know you know people kind of look at it like oh it's got this horrific heartbeat sort of sensation to it and it, I I think that plays a part definitely yeah. but I was thinking like oh I'm running away from the rage virus right now you know yeah. I was in the well, mode yeah cuz well when you especially when you listen to the the whole piece Right, it does. It has like movements to it almost, and it has that sense of like uh, get your adrenaline pumping. You yeah, know? yeah, makes you feel tense. Um, yeah, it's great. It's a great little piece of music. And I th- is it the only original piece of music in the movie? I know there's a couple like, I don't know, no, no, because I think that like the shopping scene when they're in the grocery store yeah. it has that like nice little poppies. I think that's also John Murphy as well. It's uh, it's not. It's not by John Murphy. Yeah, there's another score that kind of like just slowly elevates as well. I can't remember what that one's called either. But yeah, there's there's a couple in there. Yeah, it's not a very like robust score, I guess. It's probably like 25 minutes of music total. Yeah, Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't. Yeah, and I think the end. I think the end credits isn't like a pop song or something. Something like that. Yeah, which yeah. again, a classic, classic Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle. Yeah, cut to black, pop song. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. The, I thank you for bringing that up because uh, I did want to make a note of that because it is like that piece of music is so it's iconic and it was used in so many things. Like I think, I think it's in. Isn't it in uh, Kick Ass? There's like, um, yeah. Uh, I think it's during one of the. No, it's when they're doing the re, like the recreation of uh, Nicolas Cage's character getting in the warehouse and he's fighting all the guys. I think it was Big Daddy who had like a yeah his yes. own yeah spin on the on the theme yeah 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 they, I think they just play the theme yeah and it's been used in a few a bunch of trailers and stuff like that um, over the years it's a great piece of music they use it again in twenty eight weeks later yep <laughs> so good they use it again yeah and it wasn't also I didn't you know I meant to look this up I completely forgot I heard that there was a show was there a television series there was like a I know there's a, well, I know there's like a comic series. I don't know about television. Or maybe they were they pitched one, but I'd I'd have to double check. I don't know. It was it on Crackle. (laughs) Oh gosh. Yeah, when are they gonna put Twenty Eight Days Later on Disney Plus? Come on. I know, right? When's Ravenous gonna be on there? Come on. (laughs) (laughs) They're sitting on this library. I mean, they're doing nothing with it. All these Robert Carlyle associated things. All right. So the next up, uh, we're gonna be talking about. I can find it here. Uh, 28 weeks later. After 28 days, they thought it was over. This is what it's all about, gentlemen. Family starting again. They thought it was safe. What are you afraid of? What if it comes back? It won't come back. They were wrong. This Friday. I'm going to get you both out of here. I promise. The threat is everywhere. Eight weeks later, Rated R starts Friday only in theaters. Twenty-eight weeks later, uh, directed by Juan Carlos Fresnadillo, mouthful. Written by <laughs> Rowan Jaffe, Juan Carlos uh, Fresnadillo, uh, Enrique Lopez Levine. It stars Jeremy Renner, Rose Byrne, Robert Carlyle, Imogen Poots, and others. The logline plot synopsis is six months after the rage virus was inflicted on the population of Great Britain, the U.S. Army helps to secure a small area of London for the survivors to repopulate and start again. But not everything goes according to plan. Which is one thing we did forget to mention about 28 days later. It is revealed that basically uh, Great Britain has been quarantined. Yeah, yeah. The rest of the world is actually just functioning normally. But (laughs) they they quarantined Great Britain. And this plays off of that, the quarantine happening. Um, so we, like, we kind of spoiled a little bit at the beginning. Uh, great first act. Oh, dude, it's, it's great. I, the way they set up this world, um, this little isolated family farm sort of setting, you know, these groups of people who probably all just kind of came together, a a small little commune for themselves, you know, they, they followed all the procedures, they've blocked up their doors that, you know, they keep very quiet, they're having a nice meal together. And <laughs> it just and takes, all hell breaks loose, and it's a great because yeah. you never get to, you don't get to see this as what you think is going to be your protagonist is the coward. Yes, yes. And it tells you like you think you're going to be watching a movie from the coward's perspective, and he meets his kids, and he has to lie to them, and you think there's going to be like an arc and all of this interesting subtext that we could explore about like the idea of being quarantined in the military presence, and no. It sets up all of this stuff, all this super interesting stuff, and then does nothing with it. And then it becomes just the most rote zombie action movie ever. Not even a good one either. Not even like an entertaining one. Like, just frustrating. Well, and who's even heard of this director? He sounds like just some studio for hire. Like No, but he was handpicked. He was hand- <laughs> handpicked by Danny Boyle. Oh, wow. Okay. Here's a few of his other movies. Let's check out what else has he directed. Whereas uh, 28 Weeks Later, 
So he had only done one movie, Intacto, which I've never heard of, before he did this, which is like a action sci-fi okay. fantasy movie. Yeah. And then um, after this, he did this movie, Intruders, with Clive Owen. Oh, I've seen that. I saw that. It's not. It wasn't anything great, though. But no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. no. I saw it years ago too. I I barely remember. I remember the poster. It's like clown yeah. face, like kind of scratched out. Yeah. Um, then he does. Yeah, he's mostly done TV stuff, and now he's doing. Just announced the Sword in the Stone. He's doing. Uh, yeah, he's doing a live action Disney movie because that's oh, what everybody does. Yep. Now. Yep. Um, yeah, but again, I think he was handpicked by Danny Boyle. If I'm not. If memory okay. serves me correct, don't quote me on that, but I feel like I remember hearing that. Okay. Because, you know, at the time, it was kind of anticipated. Yeah. This was kind of anticipated to come out because it came out in 2007. It was five years after the first one came out. Um, I was excited for it. Also, Robert Carlyle uh, back yeah. in it, who was, also, who was offered the role of, uh, the, of Christopher Eccleston's character in 28 Days Later, but for one reason or another, he turned it down. Oh, that would have been so cool, though. Yeah. Thinking about, yeah. Actually, you know who was supposed to play Jim in 28 Days Later? Uh, Ewan McGregor? Ewan McGregor, yep. Ah, but nice. they had a falling out because Danny Boyle decided to go with Leonardo DiCaprio for the beach instead of him. So he got mad at him. Well. And then he decided... So they didn't talk for a while, but they're friends again. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it sets up this great, great uh, setup... Uh, a really interesting potential for characters, for a cool, interesting drama to happen. I like the, I even kind of like the idea that, like, um, even if, even if the coward father were to be infected, that like we would even kind of revisit the notion that maybe there's a little bit more going on in their heads than they had thought, because um, he's like, you know, hunting his children, kind of. Yeah. Which they just they never utilize. They never explore no. any of that stuff. It's very disappointing. After that whole first act, the characters don't really have much of any sort of arc. It's just situation, 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 and you got nothing to really, nothing that's palatable, nothing that you can really relate to or, or you know, just slow down and digest. It's just... Yeah, because it would have been interesting if they had made a movie where you watch your main character uh, let a little kid and his wife get eaten or get killed. <laughs> And then have to deal Trouble. with that, like, yeah. and have him redeem himself by the end. Yeah, like, yeah. what a great movie that would have been. <laughs> and no, they don't. They don't do any of that. He's just this, this snivelly little coward dude. And also, they change the rules of the virus. Uh, he does not get it infected by blood. He gets infect, infected by just kissing his wife. When yeah, they find, was... they find they find his wife who they find out is basically uh, she has some sort of natural immunity to the virus and Which they want to not really get explored <laughs> at all because they don't do anything. Cause like you said, it just becomes a uh, sequences. It just becomes yeah. set pieces. Um, just one after another. Yeah. There's one cool, like, I guess like just like this viscerally cool moment is uh, when the helicopter pilot kills all the zombies with uh, the helicopter blades. The turbines just like, yeah, yeah. shutting them all up. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's not. It's just 
there's just not a lot going on in the movie. This, I honestly, like, I took, like, four notes. Because I was, like, I was watching it. And I was like, there's really nothing to write. There's really not much to write down here. Um, it's just because it becomes very generic. It becomes very generic. In I, a way I, that I just didn't, like, find much. Didn't find, couldn't take away much from it, you know? It, it's almost got, like, as well, the, the, the classic, oh, the U.S. will save the day sort of scenario. And I find it very distracting when it's, you know, a... Uh, Australian Rose Byrne and and British Idris Elba, Idris Elba yeah. being the Americans. <laughs> what are you afraid of? What if it comes back? It won't come back. What if it does? If it comes back, we kill it. It's code red. <laughs> yeah, I was laughing about that too. I was like, oh, they got Idris Elba's playing an American dude. <laughs> hey, you know. Actually, that probably would have been a pretty early role for him in a movie. It was at the time, like none of these actors were were not at their their Marvel status yet, or their yeah. their other. Yeah, because Renner would have been pretty new. Rose Byrne would have been new. The only one that would have been a seasoned actor would have been Robert Carlyle, really, mm-hmm. who I love actually, and that yeah. was one of the most disappointing things. Yeah, they set up for him to have such a good character, just though, or just an interesting character, just like the potential. It was so. It was right there. Yeah, right there, Jeremy. You, you see it in his eyes as an actor. I mean, we've talked about him in depth of how much fun he was having on Ravenous, but like, you know, he, that that one shot where he's like, he's looking back at the house and then just kind of looking on, you know, escaping the horde, saying like, "Oh shit, oh shit!" Like, cause he's just in a constant panic, and he's also realizing like what he did was wrong. You know, he just abandoned everybody. <laughs> It's a it is a horrific moment. It's yeah. like a real like <gasps> like yeah. when he he because his Don Don she doesn't know what to do because the fucking kids there and he's just yeah. like oh and he just opens the window and hops out yeah <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> what the fuck I remember actually I remember when I saw this the first time like it comes so out of you just don't expect that to happen like it's yeah. legitimately shocking and uh, and then you think that that's gonna be the dude you're gonna be watching a movie about. And not so much. Nope. Also, what is the deal with the security at this place? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> are the kids are they able to get a fucking Vespa from a pizza delivery driver's little go kart? Not go kart. What do you call them? That's a Vespa, right? Isn't that what they yeah, the, the yeah the golf carts were. <laughs> yeah, whatever. This little motorcycle thing, and uh, they're able to get out and go into the the un the unquarantine zone or what are the da- out of the safe zone. They're able to just leave. How tight? Like they have so you see all the pomp and circumstance of the security when the kids show up. Yeah. To show you the the process they have to go through to get in and blah blah blah. And they just go along the bridge. There's just two people there. It's like it's yeah. not even. And then they just they just go and nobody stops them. And then also was it Robert Carlyle's just able to like so he's got his wife who they've just discovered has like this very valuable blood, uh, and he's able to just open the door and go into the room and nobody's around. We're, we're we're missing scenes where like this family in particular just has special access to everything and, and they're not <laughs> showing it to us. <laughs> well, it's just like and that's like a, it goes along with just like kind of the sequence after sequence thing. It's just all so contrived. Yeah, it, it yeah. does not feel earned, and, and nothing about it feels earned, and nothing about it feels like it makes any logical sense about like why characters do anything. You're just like, what the fuck? It, even the 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 military call to just shoot whoever even if they don't have the virus or not just just fire away at every like i don't know how in the real world that would work out or what that scenario would look like but it just seemed in the in this in this movie as far as it's concerned it just didn't work it didn't sell it for me no but they don't sell it because you don't get enough time with anybody right you don't get enough time with any characters or any situation to really like kind of think that that would be a possibility yeah Uh, because the movie is so I mean, thankfully it was under it was a pretty quick movie. It's an hour and forty minutes, which I was very thankful for. 
Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> cause I just wanted it to be over. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, they have the part where Jeremy Renner gets set on fire, and I just started laughing. <laughs> I, I laughed, too. Go! Go! I was just like, come on, guys. I didn't even know it was like, in, I, you know what's crazy? Like, I don't, they did not communicate well enough that even that was like the direness of the situation they're in. I almost like didn't understand. I'm like, oh, if he gets out of the car, they're going to kill him? I Maybe I missed something. I don't know. Sure. Maybe I was just like really had checked out because I was just like, oh, why are they setting, they're going to set him on fire now? Yeah. He can't get out and be like, yo, boys. I guess a he's, a, he's a public enemy now by that point. So. Yeah, exactly. He's like one of these... Uh, <laughs> he's an anti-vaxxer. They can't yeah, have it. There you go. The Biden administration coming down with flamethrowers. Uh, yeah, no, it was... Actually, you know, I would not say it's like... It's not even I would say it's like a bad movie. I think it's just no. pass. It could be passively entertaining. Uh, but watching it right after watching it 28 days later, it's really hard not to just be completely disappointed by it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if I had, if if it was called something else, maybe I wouldn't feel the same way. Um, although I think I would. I think it just fundamentally has problems. Um, and like I said, I think it's such a beautiful setup. Like the whole, okay, sure. like up until, basically, like it's a great movie. Up until. Uh, his wife comes back. Yeah. And then the movie just completely like collapses in on itself. Uh, but up until then, we're promised some interesting stuff. It just never comes to fruition. It, um, it, it even just kind of abandons what makes 28 Days Later so technically interesting to look at and watch. Because it, it does like this almost fake grainy filter to yeah. kind of give off the the DV look, but it's not really doing it. It's just yeah, it's like yeah, it's a weird. And they did like some weird color correction stuff to give yeah. make it like you know. And and I don't know who the DP on this was, but I think in my letterbox review of it, I said something like it's like a spurgier uh, Paul Greengrass. It's like he just takes the <laughs> camera like this and just goes sh- shapes with it so much. <laughs> well, you know that would have been a probably pretty in vogue at the time because wouldn't that have been around this? I think it's around the same time the the second Born movie came out, which is what kind of started that shit. Yeah. Uh, who is the DP on this? Well, that's why I can't watch um the uh, the, the Born Supremacy because I I'll vomit. <laughs> oh really? Did you get sick from that stuff? It's just too shaky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, he's a cinematographer. He's he actually worked with Danny Boyle on 127 Hours, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Actually, because if you think about the shakiness of it all, um, Deepwater Horizon, The Fifth Wave. He seems like a jobber. Red okay. Two, yeah, Truders. Okay. Yeah, Repo Men. <laughs> oh yeah, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just don't really have much to say about Twenty Eight Weeks Later, other than what I have. Uh, just because everything that's interesting that could have happened, like I've said ad nauseum in the past 10 minutes, like it's just squandered. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it just falls into a lot of cliches. There's jump scares that are a little bit more active and don't do anything to, to help it at all. And it's just, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's a shame. And I think I, I did read up though, that they are doing, they still plan to do a third film um, in June of 2019 Boyle, said that he and Garland had discussed preparations for a film, and then look where yeah, we well, ended it's, up. It, and is then, up. it is on IMDb. Yeah. Uh, IMDb is 28 months later. The rage infects Europe coming soon. Its uh, plot is under wraps. There's no information about it. But yeah, I had heard that as well, that they were planning on maybe revisiting it. Honestly, this would be the perfect time. Yeah. Yeah. This, I mean, I, I'd be down. I mean, it's it's weird. I was talking to a friend with this, though. Like, I don't want... See, I'm very apprehensive about the idea that they might inject a lot of um, COVID-related framework into the movie and less just more of its own sort of organic yeah. Yeah, I know what virus mean. storytelling. Because there was a period where we could have gotten a lot of... Do you remember this? Like, there was a short 
period where we're seeing a lot of like Zoom meeting movies and TV yes. shows. Yeah. I don't want like a whole, whole decade uh, the, of that. <laughs> wasn't there the, what was the one that was like really popular? Host. Uh, Host. That's the one. That was terrible, dude. <laughs> <laughs> host yeah you know i never really like i've never really spoken about it because i watched it on my laptop while i was playing a video game so yeah i wasn't really invested in it but i watched it because everybody was talking about it and every once in a while like you know what dude those shutter movies most of the time are not very good yeah they and, can't uh, and anything that has like a shutter original movie or whatever you want to call it is always the cheapest like whoever they have working there their connections, like that, that group of people, are hacks. Yeah. They're all fucking hacks. Yeah, I said it, Shutter. I said it. I pay my money. You get my six bucks a month. Yeah, it, Joe Bob wasn't convincing me. I did not like Fried Berry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my god, I watched. Yeah, I did. I watched. I th- I did not finish it. I fell asleep during it. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm not going back. But yeah. you know, I would say Fried Berry though. At least it, it was better than. Uh, some of the other ones I've watched, I can't even remember their names. They're so forgettable. Yeah. Host was one of them. That everybody in the horror circles, horror community, oh, it's a, this is so amazing. It's the best thing ever. It's like no, guys, <laughs> no. Like even their show, a uh, creep show. Do you watch creep? The- yeah, I watch. I've been. I'm up to date on it. Yeah. I mean, every once, in, like I would say, like one out of six of those ends up being like okay, and yeah. then, but most of them are just bad. They're just bad. They're just, yeah. Like I don't like there's I don't even know what else to say about them. They're just bad. And the people behind the scenes, you would think that you were gonna get something I don't know, more interesting, but very rarely. Actually one of my one of the ones I actually liked the most was like an an adaptation, I think, of a Joe Hill or a Stephen King story where Kiefer mm-hmm. Sutherland did the voice. It was one of the animated ones. Okay. It's like a guy on an island. He has to try to survive. It was actually pretty good. That one was pretty good. Okay. Okay. But but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I've been a. I've not been a too. I like Shutter as like an idea. I like that. That's why like I support them because I I like it as the concept of having like a horror genre streaming service. I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'll be honest with you, man. I don't watch it very much. I don't use it very often. No, I mean, there's not a lot of drawing unless, yeah, you're going to something like The Last Drive-In or if you're just there for a lot of the classics that they sometimes bring back. Because there's a lot of films um, I'd always been... Like, I got the first time I made a Shutter account was when I decided to see the movie Ken Russell's uh, The Devils. Because it was yeah, on they, there. I was like, holy yeah. shit, I gotta watch this now. The Devils Burn. An explosive film. Absolutely brilliant. ABC TV. Superbly, frighteningly effective. Time magazine. But of course I can prove nothing. This Mother Superior may be little more than a hysterical nun. Exactly. Mere conjecture. And what form does this incubus take? (laughs) The Devils is not a film for everyone. Vanessa Redgrave, Oliver Reed, in Ken Russell's film of The Devils. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no. I, I do think for curation and the stuff that they do get on the, on the service is actually admirable. And that's why like, I like to like, give them some money, because they yeah, do yeah. cycle in some stuff, and it's bringing some classics to the attention of a like, new generation. There's a lot of like younger people that are hooked into shutter and stuff like that and now they all like write about how they're all secretly like queer movies but <laughs> like, that's there's a whole wing of horror twitter that's all they do everything is a is a secretly a queer movie and you're like okay whatever yeah we're bringing, <laughs> we're bringing you know, a second installment of horror noir like what is, <laughs> the hell? you just made that up oh my god horror noir that documentary yeah, yeah. where it was like the the girl from the craft talking for f- most of the movie about how she thinks everything is racist yeah i was like man we're giving a lot of airtime to the girl from the craft like can we listen to can tony todd get in here yeah i like his voice can we just get back to him <laughs> i was actually you know just as a little tangent like i know we're kind of just going everywhere but that's sure. the magic of 28 weeks later um uh tony todd like they talk shit about tony todd in that movie about oh, they Candyman. they talk mad shit about Candyman. About how it's like some 
colonizer movie. Like, like, it's like how nasty are you people? Jesus Christ, Tony, Tony Todd's in this documentary. Like, yeah. have some, like, have some fucking respect. Yeah. Well, he's and ah, was he in the uh, the new one? I didn't see the new Candyman. I did. I saw the new Candyman. It is not great. Um, he's a, he has a cameo. I don't want to spoil it for anybody that may, maybe wants to see it, but he does have a very brief cameo. Okay. They basically they they ruin Candyman. <laughs> That's what I gather. I was and I'm not a huge Candyman like franchise fan. Like I like I think the first movie is pretty good for what it is. It's like a yeah. gothic horror thriller movie. Uh, I've never like I've never thought of of Candyman as like one of the boogeymen, like a Jason or a Freddy. I've just never really made that connection with that character. But um, and I'm not very familiar with its two sequels. But I I do enjoy the first one and this and the new one is a direct sequel of the first one. And uh, yeah, they they just do kind of what they do with horror movies now. Anything that's like a sequel from a movie that came out thirty years ago, they just do like a deconstructionist take on the material. Yeah. And and it's just it's just kind of boring. It's just not like it's not as subversive as they think it is. And then it's you know they inject a lot of modern day politics with like kind of police stuff and gentrification. This whole movie is about gentrif- gentrification, and they will tell you that ad nauseum. Like every five minutes, somebody brings up gentrification. Uh, that, <laughs> it's seeped into like I, I sound like a broken record whenever I talk about the horror genre, but it's seeped into it so deep where it's like it's really hard to find. Dude, like that woke community, horror movies. Dude, that woke community took over horror. Like it's yeah. a, it is a not a good landscape right now. It's not yeah. interesting. It's the most like, and it's it's all very boring and vanilla because they don't, like they they only want to like offend the people they think, like purposefully. Like they're not doing it. I don't know what's the what's the right way to put it. Like there's a way to like make provocative genre stuff. That is offensive in a certain respect, but the way they want to construct the offensiveness is to like mm-hmm. just call people evil, this group of people evil, and everybody else is good. And it's just very like directed. It's not like I'm not making any sense. I'm not. I'm not. Co- this these thoughts are not coherent. But like, um, I get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, it's just like it's woke politics in movies, and it's and it's in the horror genre. Like the last place, and that's the thing that pisses me off the most, Jeremy. I got to tell you, these people spend their entire lives, and careers, their all their time, fucking talking about how awesome this fucking rape flick from 1976 is, and then like be offended <laughs> about something that would come out in a movie today. You're like, what the fuck, guys? It's a movie. It's a yeah. movie. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Like all everybody that works at Fangoria, my wife got me as a gift. Uh, she got me a subscription to the new Fangoria. Okay. We c- we canceled that shit and got our money back. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah, I mean, like, on uh, one of my earlier episodes on, on uh, my podcast, uh, Fleep It After Dark, we covered um, The House on the Edge of the Park, and it's 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 90 minutes of David Hess uh, harassing women and, and cutting them and, and, and raping. Yeah. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Doing that classic David Hess stuff. Yeah. I saw, you know, I have not seen that movie, and I've been waiting to. I but I found a copy of it, so I'm going to watch it before I I listen to your podcast. But uh, nice, yeah, because I was like, oh, cool. I actually I did, was not very familiar with that. I mean, I know who David Hess is, obviously, but sure, um, I was not familiar with that one. He, um, he he's an actor. I've always. I mean, it's a shame that uh, he passed away, but I have always wanted to work with him. Like after seeing him in Last House on the Left, like when I was. Again, going on my early horror journey, I was just like, yeah. "Oh, this guy's like really something." <laughs> well, because we came up in a time like you know, and I know you're a little younger than me, but like all of this stuff was reissued on DVD. Yeah. Like when we were growing up, like so when I was like in my late teens, and you would have been at the time you were starting to get into like movies, all of it was starting to come out on DVD, and none of it was super expensive either, because I used to own every every movie dude that I bought for like five dollars back in two thousand four. Now it costs thirty five dollars from fucking Shout Factory. It's so frustrating. <laughs> and and then a lot of times they don't even port the they don't even port over all the special features. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, like it's just like how many discs, how many copies of the thing do I have to carry around with me? Yeah. Which I got a, I got the, I need another copy of the thing coming in the mail, Jeremy. <laughs> how to get that four K, dude? Well, he's like, look, with all the problems in the world and all the struggles and everything, 
you, you gotta understand the hustle of the the film collector. <laughs> it's it's tough God. for us. It's <laughs> tough out there. It's tough out there. It's fun though. It's part of the hunt. Although I do like I. It's it's not as fun as it used to be because now it's all on, on online now. Yeah. I used to really love going to like just places that could buy movies, flea markets, the thrill of the hunt. Because that, that was a time where not everything was immediately available to you at the f- touch of your fingers at any moment. Mm-hmm. I used to have to go drive 90 minutes to a mall somewhere, to the good mall, to go like find like the obscure DVD so I could go buy like Peter Jackson's Meet the Feebles for $35. You know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> now, but that, that reality is not, that doesn't exist anymore. Now, I can just go check online. I could probably rent it for $2, you know? I had a very robust collection because I was working from a very young age. I had a job when I was a teenager. so And I spent all my money on movies and driving to malls to buy movies, driving yeah. places to find them. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a different, it's a different paradigm nowadays. It's not as fun as it used to be, but mm-hmm. it's still there. It's still there. Definitely. I, I, I got a kick out of going. There's a place near where I live called Big Lots. Okay. And they they have uh, a lot of two and three dollar movies, so you'll find Blu-rays that were like around like five or six years ago, and now they're at Big Lots. So I I always go in there and get a bunch of stuff. Now right now they have a bunch of Paramount movies. Picked up The Equalizer two the other day. Very exciting. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let me know if uh, uh in that movie if Denzel Washington touches his chin because he does that in every movie apparently. I don't. I never picked up on that, but I guess. <laughs> I mean, I've never picked up on that either. <laughs> yeah. I love me some Denzel, dude. Though I'd watch. You know, Denzel should have been in Twenty Eight Weeks Later. Yeah, would have made that much movie much better. At least I would have had Denzel. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, Twenty Eight Days Later. I I was really uh, really enjoyed the revisit. It had been a while since I'd actually like really like sat down and watched it. Um, just because I watched it so much when I was uh, when it came out, it's one of those movies that like, even though it had been like six or seven years since I'd really watched it, it felt like I had watched it like the day before. Like that's how many times I've seen that movie. Um, Twenty eight weeks later, no. <laughs> yeah, cut that I mean, your life. <laughs> I'm, I'm still gonna have to keep it on the shelf because it'll drive me crazy to know that it exists, and then I have to have them next to each other. For posterity, that's what I call it. Twenty weeks later, like terrible cover by comparison. By the I way, I know. Look at this cheap. Like exactly, it looks like a fucking like a like oh like one of those cheapo knockoff movies that you find like the asylum movies that you'd find at like Walmart for seven dollars. It's just no thought or no care at all. <laughs> just lame. Just lame. Yeah, oh, I, although I mean honestly, I wish that the eyes weren't on this one. I think you could get rid of the Rage Eyes. Okay, sure. I think you could get rid of that. Well, there's probably a reference to something. I always thought they were like, when I first saw the cover, it was two suns or something, but I, Star Wars did that already with their moons or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, um, but I would say, like, yeah, like, uh, especially with 28 Days Later, like, I also just kind of overall appreciate for the time that mm-hmm. it came out, and it really lends to just the stylistic and really intriguing visual nature of it. Because there were other movies, too, that were also really playing with digital video at that age. And you can yes. say the cinema landscape kind of was changing post-9-11, and quite heavily so. But I, I do have such nostalgia for that period. And I hope, I myself am trying to bring that back a little bit. I hope others are out there who have some respect for it or some nostalgia for it too. I think I think it is coming back in a way because there is kind of like this reinvigorated sense of the DIY kind of sense because now everybody theoretically it's very like it's never been easier to make a movie. And yeah. uh, people kind of going back and then now there's a generation of people now that are in positions to start making stuff uh, that are familiar with that. They have nostalgia for that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. I have nostalgia for it like we talked about like I really do. Like it takes me, it's like a time capsule watching something like 28 Days Later. It takes me back to a, a different part of my life. Same thing when I watch um, uh, David Lynch's Inland Empire. Have you ever seen that? It's on my list, but I saw you reviewed it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it is, it's all, it's, it's even more like mini DV than 28 Days Later is. 
it's even more apparent that that's what they were using. It's a very mm-hmm. hard movie to find, actually, nowadays. Okay. I did. I torrented that, okay? I used to own it. I used to own it. Hey, uh, with Thanksgiving coming up soon, like, if you guys, if, if anybody out there who's listening, or even you, Sean, if you haven't seen um, Pieces of April, uh, that's a classic one, too. That's also shot on digital video. Uh, who's in that again? It's... Um, Oh man, I I don't know if I've seen this. It sounds so familiar. Yeah, uh, but the, I mean, the, in the realm of Thanksgiving themed movies, there's not many, and that's a that's a good one. I'd I'd, I'd recommend to anybody. Okay, cool. It's like uh, Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes. Yep. Okay. Two thousand three. Yep. Came out. I mean, a year after. Twenty eight days later. Yeah, it really was the thing for a minute, huh? Mm-hmm. Like the yeah the uh, the mini DV stuff. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, this was a, a ton of fun, and uh, I didn't know I'd have so much more to, to say about 20 Days Later, but it was really good to revisit that. Uh, probably not going to watch 28 Weeks Later, except for maybe uh, the opening scene ever again. <laughs> I know. Why? Just be a mad? Just be mad that it doesn't live up to that? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so where can people find you, Jeremy? Yeah, so um, you can follow me over at Jeremoby. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I am on Letterboxd. Um, you can also keep up with me on SoundCloud, where I run the Flea Pit After Show program. Uh, new episode. Uh, I, I, this episode This episode of 20 Days Later is going to come out a bit later than when I say this, but September 8th will be the, the, the date or the release for my latest Flea Pit After Dark episode on the way of the gun. So get excited for that one. Yeah, and then, McCoury, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, uh, working on a couple other uh, short uh, films at the moment. Stewie, the Demon Swine, is a quasi documentary that's coming out very soon about my friend's demon pig. It's not really that evil. I just make it. I play it up, you know. Yeah. And then uh, uh, another short film called Tape Deck, which is uh, in the re-edit stages, and people want to see these, so I'm trying to get them done. So. Awesome, dude. I'm, well, yeah. I'm really looking forward to those. Um, yeah, and I'll have as as many of those links as I can in the description so you can go follow Jeremy's stuff. And go check out Flea Pit After Dark. It's a great podcast. He's always talking about kind of, uh, I would say, off-the-beaten-path movies. And, uh, and like just like we talked about that David Hess movie that he had mentioned before, it, I, get, I learn stuff and I get introduced to new things. So I, I really enjoy it myself. Um, and for everybody else, you know where to find me. Uh, links in the description for that stuff on Twitter at Sean Zubox, and that's probably the best place to get a hold of me. Especially if you want to talk movies, want to talk shit, come find me over on Twitter. All right, everybody, thank you again, Jeremy. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be on. Thanks. Adios. Bye.